All right, we're recording. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this event. We're so glad you're here today. Thank you for joining us. I'm Amy Kremen, the moderator for the event today, and I'm really excited to be here in this role. Um, I met Rorick because he's on the board of a project I manage, the USDA NIFA funded Ogallala Aquifer, Ogallala Water Coordinated Ag Project. And, uh, and, another, and now he's connecting to another role for a project that I manage called the Irrigation Innovation Consortium that's funded by the Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research. I think many of you have similar stories of being connected to Rorick's farm and acres and through his various projects and pushing us all to innovate and collaborate. Um, today, we're gonna explore that further and how we all could or do already connect to Rorick's acres and how we might work together. Um, we're gonna cover a lot of ground, exploring lots of ideas and uh, for how we can deliver systems, systems of solutions that work together that can help farmers achieve productivity, profitability, and sustainability goals. We're gonna take a quick look at the agenda. We've got an action-packed day. First Work's gonna take us on a farm tour to set the themes of the stage for many of the ideas that we're gonna delve into deeper along the way, followed by a fantastic lineup of lightning round speakers who are gonna give three-minute presentations on a wide range of issues. We'll have a quick break, come back for deeper reflection and conversation by a fantastic panel before we move to next steps and wrap up. So just a quick reminder that this session is being recorded. A link is going to be shared with you all after the event, along with some other materials related to how we make this network, which some of us know we're part of, but by the end of the day, you'll realize that you're all part of this very large network and hopefully made some really great new connections you'll want to follow up on. So we'll help support that. And uh, with that, oh, and the last thing I'd like to say is we're going to use the chat pretty heavily today. So if you've got questions, comments, ideas, do not hesitate. You are welcome to drop everything in the chat and we'll field some questions that way and be talking on the back end about how to kind of channel some of these themes that you're raising in the chat uh, to the conversation shared by everyone. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to our host for today. Rourke, we couldn't do this at your farm, but it's so great that you decided to go ahead and do this, and we're going to have a great, fun virtual event today. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. And, and I have a couple thank yous right off the get-go, and that's Amy's leadership uh, today. Uh, you'll see Susan Hutton, who has provided the video, and uh, Crystal uh, Powers, who has really uh, is the is really the mortar between the bricks and I couldn't done this uh, we've done it collaboratively in a team and it's it's really come together rather quickly so I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the whys or or me it's more importantly about is what what why are we here why are why are we even interested in connecting the acre or broadband over cropland uh, we're gonna we're, I'm just gonna touch a lot of spaces that that are challenges for us, but opportunities, I believe, for not only agriculture, but also our state and also our, for our communities. And as we look at those opportunities, why aren't we doing this? That's the question I have. Why aren't we doing it? Go ahead, Susan. Let's go ahead with this. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. So, sorry. Oop. So it starts with the ground. It starts with on-site monitoring. It starts with the piece of the puzzle that all of us puts to put puts it in a place. So go ahead and there you go. <clears throat> so the seed, genetics. Each one of those boxes is approximately 125 acres, but most people don't know that. But what goes into the decision process to place that seed, to put the agronomy in place, to figure out what is actually occurring before we even start. It's pre-planning. Go ahead. Compost, fertility, all of those things are, are active in our operations and trying to monitor it. How do we understand the, 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 compl the, the complicity that, that goes with these ideas about applications, but more importantly, the challenges that it takes to measure and monitor and help to make that decision? Where do you even put it? How much do you put it? The equipment that it takes to deliver water. Here you're looking at a 
high efficiency motor and a variable frequency drive and and those when we first started this all we wanted was a machine to deliver water now it's an application tool and the pieces that were sold in terms of, of add-ons to our equipment is what's the next best idea and how do we vet that and more importantly is what do we do with the data that is a result of these pieces of equipment and what are they telling us and it all boils down to climate it boils down to soil health it all the questions and tying it clear back to the consumer the consumer is asking us over and over what are you doing with and how are you interfacing with all of the pieces of this puzzle and how do we get there imagery this is imagery from just a few days ago go back just a little bit susan thank you is this this was a variety trial and i would not have known this not so very long ago but if you look at those three blue dots all that is is just zeroing in on green snap and and we had a adjuster out but he happened to walk in only the places where there wasn't any damage so we walked out of that field and he said gosh it's only three percent but when you get into the other places it's forty percent that's a yield reduction would we have known that uh, prior to technology and delivery of that data helping us to make better decisions but also guide and and put us in the right place at the right time and what are we after we're a large popcorn grower. It's about quality. It's about quantity. But more importantly is that trust, that delivery all the way through the system, through the network, through the collection of that data, all the way to the consumer is what are we giving you? These are black eyed peas. And, and it doesn't look like much, but do they look like this when they actually end up on the shelf? Maybe, maybe not. But how do I, how do I be able to deliver that with a high level of confidence into what the consumer has their expectations? And how do I measure that? And it occurs 24 seven. It happens. We're, we're not only just measuring the crop or looking at, we're looking at every piece of the system. It's an entire system. It happens from delivery. It happens when it hits the bin. How do we, how do we know what kind of quality? If you look at the bottom part of this slide, there's fill level, there's protein, there's oil, starch. They're, they're measuring that in real time and helping us not only deliver but also with a high level of confidence monitor what we're actually going to deliver to the consumer. Go ahead. But it still has to be ground truth. There still has to be boots on the ground. There's still got to be support. We still have to make sure that it works properly. And it's still, again, it happens around the clock. So how do you do all these things? We, we work at it every day. So it isn't just simply about growing the crop. It really is the whole system and the, the data and the points and the sensors that go into the creation of that process of where we're ending. But we still got to have a little fun. And Mother Nature still has a significant role, if not the final say, in what all of this means and what all of this is conveyed at the very end. Good example of technology and, and, and the progression of technology, but we're still ground truthing. We still have to be able to have a high level of confidence and trust in where we're headed. I often tell many of my friends, especially the uh, engineers that are on this call today, is don't explain to me how to build the clock. All I want to know is what time it is. On the right is simply that same piece of equipment that I want to know exactly how it's performing, but I understand that on the, on the back side of it, there's a very complicated and robust support system to deliver that, deliver that piece. So where does it all come to? It comes to the data and how is it delivered? and the expectation of how it gets to us. Go ahead. FBN is, is one of those that they're disruptors, but then you have a day like three days ago and I disliked having these weeds next to my crop and I thought I, I knew better than what the, the mud hole was telling me and decided I wanted to mow that. So my son decided this was a good one to post on Twitter. So, you know, you still make mistakes. But across the gamut, so here's, here's just a snapshot of a soil moisture probe, a scanner of a of an ear of corn that's given me a moisture and, and geo-referenced and, and satellite imagery and, and the complexity of these decisions that we're asking a producer to be able to in, in, invest in and not only uh, uh, regurgitate back out to us and, and, and lean into those trusted advisors. So what does that mean? Simply sending out a, a piece of data, capturing it, putting it into an as applied and, and putting it up on the cloud what does that mean to us? Is it making better decisions? We don't know because of all the silos that, it, that it's housed in. But what we do know is, is the picture helps us. This is a good example of, of utilizing that data. 
it is still recommended roughly about 1.2 pounds of nitrogen to grow a bushel of corn. This will, we, we shoot, our goal is 0 0.6 to 0 0.7 here on this farm. We base it off of an ROI model. We want to return on our investment. Yeah, it's great to say we can grow 300, but we can't. This is a project that I'm working on within the Twin Plat NRD. If you look to the left there, the, the uh, acres and the acre inches below that are the applied water and then the water usage per month. This is in real time providing back to producers withdrawals. We're in a regulated basin in the Republican and I also farm in the Platte. And, and those expectations and understandings, we don't wanna pump water to pump water. It costs money, it is energy. These are projects that I'm involved in. It still has to have an ROI. It still has to be tied back to what, how do we do it? How do we make money doing this? And what is that asset worth in, in that investment, either in the sensor, the data, the relationship, the network, whatever it is. Go ahead, Susan. So it, it, we're seeing in real time elevators. They're seeing the bids, go ahead. And then what does it come back to? This is a dashboard that we utilize, that we look at from a task management piece that, that we put together by crop, by, by field. And then as we do the as applied in real time, this feeds right back into this and it feeds us and tells us exactly uh, what based off of what our prediction was or our budget was to actually what is occurring. So where do we go from here? It's not my, it is not my father, or my grandfather's farm. It really isn't. This is from 1953. It's right across the road and we just finished tearing it down. And, 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 and that's okay that we're making room for what's next. So what is next? Go ahead. So I'm on the right, I'm, <clears throat> go back just one slide really quickly. So I'm on the right, I'm third generation. My son is fourth standing there on the left. And, and how do you tell? He demands and expects to be connected. And, and at, at the acre level, no longer is it, is it are we satisfied with, with a wireless data that may or may not connect or may or may not transmit? We are not satisfied. We are demanding that we do something better because the tools that we have at our hand, we have got to be able to, to be profitable to have an ROI. So where do we go from here? I'm gonna introduce Crystal Powers. She has done a, she's done a lot of work here and this really sets up uh, what a farmer, where they are today. Crystal, take it away. You're muted, Crystal. Yeah. Thanks, Rourke. It's uh, been a real pleasure planning this out with Rourke and, and all of the speakers. I'm really looking forward to it. So what we wanted to do was try to conceptually capture how do we all connect? Because we're a big network, um, or a big system. And right now, we're funneling everything into the farmer. And so they're the ones making the decisions. So they're getting all of this data and input from, from crop consultants, from the apps and the tools that are out in the field. And, and then they have to send that information back out in the form of decisions. Or if, if we're a researcher, we go to the farmer and ask for their data. So everything's focused around that farmer to receive it process it and then turn it into a decision or send it back out. And the thing to remember, this is kind of a simplified view of it. The more precision we bring to the farmer, the, the idea is it'll help drive decisions. We also have to remember that each of, each of those requires more data coming into the farmer. And so I think if, I, if I've caught correctly from Mark, he can correct me if I'm wrong, he's got something like 100 apps that he's trying out on his operation and it covers 80 different fields and a lot of those are sending daily if not even shorter time step data back to Rorik and so um, as a farmer this can be really overwhelming and so we're really fortunate to have Rorik who's willing to test out all of these things but I think the discussion today is about how do we make this more user friendly for the farmer as well and, and do that by interconnecting ourselves in more efficient and in ways that make sense to make better decisions at the end. So I'll stop there so we can hear from all our wonderful uh, lightning round speakers. I'll turn it back to you, Amy. Thanks, Crystal. Okay, so here we go. We're gonna jump into this lightning round. These will be short talks, about three minutes. And um, 
As a reminder, everyone, go ahead and hit the chat with questions, comments, and ideas. This will all be downloaded and saved and be used to piece the story together. Um, Justin, let's do a quick mic check on you and away we'll go if you're ready. I'm ready. Can you hear me okay? Perfect. Thank you. Well, I'm Justin Welch and uh, I work for Syngenta Seeds in the U.S. I'm the digital lead and uh, Rorick and I uh, had our first opportunity to, to visit not long ago and um, learned we had a lot in common uh, from uh, the same challenges and pains that Rorick brought up earlier about all of these connected or disconnected systems. How do they get built in a way that farmers can put them together to make real decisions? And uh, I've spent 25 years in the precision ag business uh, from retail to Pioneer and now to Syngenta, uh, trying to help farmers do that exact thing. And at Syngenta, you know, one of the things that we focused on is the connected farm. Just as, uh, as Rorick mentioned, um, you know, having 100 apps isn't a bad thing if all of them do very specific things, but they all better have the same data and connectivity behind the scenes that allow for you to learn in real time and use each one of those apps on their own. You know, and our platform is called Illuminate and uh, with Golden Harvest. And that Illuminate plan is kind of built in that same way where how do you go from developing the right uh, process and modeling for seed selection through prescriptive uh, management descript, um, opportunities to scouting those fields with um, imagery or with real-time weather to be able to make decisions and then pull that data together to make decisions that actually make money for the farmer. Um, after 25 years in the precision ag business, I think that's something that's been real challenging is, is how do we help farmers do that. Next slide, please. And if you look at the slide here where, you know, we look at this from three different aspects. We're looking at it from uh, a return on seeds that if you buy seed from a seed company, how do you make sure that that's the right seed that you purchased that's going to pay you back the dollars that you need? Not just genetics, but traits or seed treatments and the different things that are included in that bag that help help you make that decision to um, stay profitable on the farm. At our prices today, we can't afford to spend money on technology just because it's cool. It's really got to be able to give a payback to the operation and it needs to be connected to the other things that farmers are trying to put into their uh, uh, own operations as well. Daily chores is about this idea of if you know what's going on in the operation, how do you tell a farmer in a way that allows for them to make decisions on the spot and on the go? And daily chores really drives that. And that's something we focus on uh, putting together for farmers as well. Next slide. And then lastly is track and trace. How do you take this data and put it together in a way that um, not only us as farmers can use it in a way to make better decisions, but how does it go on to our middle processors or possibly even the consumer so that we can be attached to consumers. One thing that we're very passionate about is uh, bringing consumers back to the table to know what's going on in agriculture. And I think we're gonna be able to help do that in the future at Syngenta. Thanks for your time and I appreciate being a part of uh, your session. Right on time, well done. <laughs> Paul, can we turn to you, are you there? Yes, I'm here, can you hear me? Perfectly. Okay, good. My apologies for not having a video up. My uh, internet at home went out this morning, so I'm sitting out outside of Starbucks in Encinitas, California, hoping that everything stays together. But anyway, that's me and my problems today. But Locus Agricultural Solutions is an ag microbials company focused on soil health and, more importantly, the impact of improved soil health on crop production and, and soil carbon sequestration. And Two topics I wanted to talk about today, both related to, to Rorick's farm. One is nitrous oxide detection. Most of you know that, that that can be an issue in agriculture. Generally, nitrous oxide emissions are worth about three to four CO2 equivalents per, per acre. Uh, and, but, but measuring it and controlling it can be a difficult thing, measuring in particular. Under, under the guise, you can't control what you can't measure. Typically, it takes a an $80,000 gas met analyzer to work around a field and, and, and measure what's going on, which just isn't uh, uh, viable at all commercially. Maybe for academic, it's great. But uh, I just wanted to relay that, that uh, Locus uh, has been awarded one of the six ARPA-E contracts in combination with Princeton and a few other folks to develop a drone-based nitrous oxide detector. We're very excited about it. It'd be quite sensitive, drone-based, uh, allow for real-time detection at very sensitive levels of nitrous oxide. And Rorick's Farm will, will be one of the test beds for, for, for that program. So we're very excited to get that, that program started. 
The second topic is, 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 is related to that, uh, uh, optimizing carbon sequestration and monetizing that for, for, for growers. We do a lot of focus on that. Uh, and Locus works with Nori and the Colorado State Comet Farm Program through our Carbon Now program. And this is a process of both quantifying soil carbon resulting from deploying regenerative farming practices, and, but more importantly, monetizing that for that improved carbon for, for growers. And I'm very happy to relay today that we literally are within a, 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 a day or two of getting validated credits in place for our first grower, uh, his name is uh, Kelly Garrett in Iowa, uh, through this program, which in turn will allow uh, Kelly to sell those credits to buyers through the Nori marketplace. Uh, it, it, it took a lot of time for us to get that in place and get started, but now we are now working with several people, including Rorick, to get tradable credits in, in their hands yet this year as well. So it's a, it's a great opportunity. I think we're, we're entering an age when, when growers can be paid for two crops. One, the above ground crop that we have concentrated on for millennia, and now the below ground crop as well. So that's it, thank you. Thanks, Paul. Turn to Darren. We'll turn to Darren now with Cortiva. Uh, good morning, everyone, uh, and thank you, Rorick, for uh, uh, the invitation to join you fine folks. I uh, appreciate it. So um, if you want to advance the slide, uh, I thank you. Uh, so I want to talk about Granular Insights, and Granular Insights is a product we launched, or we released in back in January, and it has really two components. One is analysis, where we are trying to help the farmer go beyond visualization of the data to better understand the impact of the agronomic decisions that he makes every day. Um, and then the second component is directed scouting to help utilize uh, and get more value out of satellite imagery and save him time in scouting his fields. So here we're looking at uh, just the image of, of two, two data layers. So imagery on the left and, and a harvest map on the right. So you can start to see the imagery start to mirror the harvest map. And if you're served up the images every couple of days through the growing season, it can help you respond and react and make decisions to uh, to help you eliminate um, uh, potential problems that may come up. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we can also, um, there's many different data layers that you can view, but another example would be to build a profit map with your, uh, your own uh, financial analysis or your, your financials or inputs. Um, so here to better understand uh, acres in a field that we're making money on and acres of the field that we're not making money on and is there anything that I can do about it or some changes that I wanna make? Next slide, please. Uh, so directed scouting. Uh, for years, farmers have, have uh, uh, enjoyed satellite imagery. Um, they love the perspective that you get from the sky, but it's been difficult to execute on. If I have 50 farms, uh, can I really look at satellite imagery on every farm every week of the growing season? That's been very difficult for farmers to execute on. So they've asked us, could you tell me which fields I need to look at each week to save me time? So that's what we've done. Next slide. Um, we've given the farmer the ability to sort his fields by imagery. And here we're looking at in-season change, looking at the last 15 days of imagery and sorting fields into high risk, medium risk and low risk buckets. So instead of maybe needing to look at 50 farms this, this week, I, I can see that I have four cornfields or four popcorn fields corn fields in Rorick's case that maybe I need to look at this week um, that, that require my attention. So telling them which fields, telling the farmer which fields to look at and which fields to be concerned about in any given week. Uh, next slide. Uh, and then to the summary page, and this is just really a page to sort your data as I would say seven ways to Sunday. Um, here we're looking at 2019 corn yield by field, but you can sort it yield by hybrid, yield by soil type, and then look beyond that, um, look at return on seed investment, um, look at uh, population by field, population by hybrid, and so on, uh, to better analyze and, and get more out of the data that you're collecting. Uh, next slide. And then we come to what I call my favorite page. It's the insights page. And the reason I like this is farmers have always told me that um, they may not be so interested in, uh, in hybrid yield, 
um, across a given area because that story has been written on their farm. They understand that. They don't need me to tell them that. But they are more interested in what I would call agronomic yield data, um, helping them make decisions. Uh, so we have some, some reports that are built from their data, from their operation only, to help them give them insight into decisions that they should be making or analyzing. Here we're looking at a bar chart of the yield by harvest moisture, trying to help a farmer track, uh, um, track uh, phantom yield loss. So there's a bar for each point of moisture through his corn harvest that he, he harvested last fall. And it, trying to understand as my crop dries down, am I losing bushels? And is there something I could do about that? Uh, what could I change? Could I, does it pay me to dry more bushels and start harvest earlier? or add equipment to go through harvest faster, just giving them a different perspective and, um, and understanding, okay, is this something I really wanna act on or am I in really good shape with, with how I'm doing things today? We also have a yield by planting date to understand am I hitting the right planting windows or were there some days I was out there in the planter when maybe I really shouldn't have been. Um, we just added a beta report in a yield projection we call yield predict using satellite imagery, topography and weather to project yield every 16 days from about middle, the mid part of the summer, uh, right up to harvest to help a farmer plan for what, he's, uh, what he is producing out there. And we will be adding in uh, nitrogen use efficiency reporting and uh, yield by seeding rate report. To all, all basically in a click of a mouse to give a farmer more insight, more, uh, um, more use of his data, a different perspective and a different way of looking at his data. Thank you uh, again for uh, inviting me today. Thank you for that. We'll turn to, to Jeff with IBM. Good day to everyone. Hope you can hear me now. Uh, I, I often find that uh, when I'm introduced uh, relative to our IBM, uh, many folks say, well, I, I haven't heard that name relative to agriculture, uh, you know, maybe ever. Uh, but IBM, uh, of course, is uh, uh, certainly a well-known brand and certainly a, a, a company, especially through our weather company uh, capabilities, uh, certainly has a lot because weather is, is so uh, re, uh, related to the productivity of crops. And uh, so what IBM has been doing over the last couple of years is uh, to have been uh, applying a lot of the, the weather science as well as its data capacity uh, and understanding of connectivity and, and uh, data analytics and physical sciences. Uh, to agricultural challenges and, and not just so much uh, challenges that farmers face, but also we realize that agriculture globally is an ecosystem of both producers as well as uh, you know, some of the companies that bring the inputs as well as uh, the companies that are taking the outputs of agriculture and turning it into products that consumers and uh, industry utilize on a daily basis. So I'm gonna quickly uh, give you an overview of, of three categories of, of offerings or products uh, that IBM has been uh, delivering uh, for some time now. Uh, this uh, uh, slide uh, uh, portrays our, our capabilities and what we call crop forecast. This is just an example of looking at things like crop yield and quality across uh, both time and space. Uh, what we've done is tried to, in the absence of uh, field level data, uh, put together analytics that help uh, companies that try to understand what's the market uh, production capacity and, and where is it actually located for important crops to certain companies. This one happens to be an example of barley and pulses in France, uh, but we're also involved with companies that are in oilseed uh, um, trading, uh, as well as uh, uh, large uh, uh, seeded grains, uh, such as corn, Corn, uh, oil seeds and such as soybean and in uh, other areas of the world uh, trying to help folks put together this understanding based upon history based upon other sources of information how does this year's crop vary uh, on a very uh, field level basis uh, with what historically has happened and I'm based in Iowa uh, you, you folks uh, at least from Nebraska skirted a little bit of the derecho uh, earlier this year but uh, we certainly fell the brunt of it here in central Iowa and so uh, oftentimes these weather uh, extremes and impacts 
are unpredictable and oftentimes hit us uh, in unpredictable fashion. And so trying to look at this and the impact of these things in the context of history is oftentimes useful. I've heard comments relative to things like uh, crop insurance, but also things like green quality. And now with a little bit of rain outside, uh, that may become the next issue. Go ahead to, the, to our next slide then. Hopefully there's a next slide. Ah, crop optimizer. So uh, one of the things that we're also doing is, is rather than trying to use uh, a, a lot of, of uh, data that perhaps maybe uh, is somewhat challenging for some organizations and IBM, in addition to areas that I've already mentioned, like in North America, South America, and Europe, also deals with large customers in areas uh, uh, in the uh, Southeast Asia, er areas where perhaps maybe data, just even uh, getting access to data has been a real challenge and don't have the, the track record that, that uh, you know, uh, I've seen demonstrated already in some of the information that Rorick shared. So, uh, you know, trying to develop uh, insights on what data is available uh, oftentimes is, is helpful to these ag businesses and to the producers to try and figure out what are the right production practices in order to generate the results that my markets that I'm serving, whether that be for sugar cane or palm oil or what have you, how can we adjust those successful crop productions practices and and migrate those to folks that are perhaps maybe still struggling in, in different areas and it's all context sensitive such as the soil health and the landscape as well as with the, the limitations in, in uh, technology uh, that each producer or each area might experience and so these kind of techniques help farmers have insights and also help uh, agribusinesses gain some insight ahead of time as to what might be coming in their own particular markets. So uh, I will put in the chat a link to some more information about what IBM has been doing in this area, uh, but I very much uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak to you more on behalf of my employer today. Thank you. So much. Eric, with, with Jane, we'll, we'll turn to you. Okay, um, I'd like to share my screen. Sure, let me uh, exit real fast. Okay. Okay. There we go. Can everyone see my presentation? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, Yes, Jane Irrigation is the, the micro and irrigation technology leader. We're a global company with more than 25,000 monitoring and control sites for irrigation uh, around the world. So I'm happy to participate in this lightning round. Our irrigation suite of agronomic tools are sold through what we call Jane Logic. It's a platform uh, for us and it's basically a digital dashboard where this platform takes inputs from a variety of sensors, including soil moisture probes, uh, moisture monitoring equipment, EC monitoring equipment, weather data, along with satellite imagery calculating ETC, vigor, along with highlights of weekly and monthly changes for this satellite information. So over the years, We've been able to acquire leading startups, and we've made some significant progress with these startups and made additional partnerships as well, along with this continuous development of these uh, agronomic and irrigation suite of tools uh, to be able to provide a, a, you know, an amazing end user uh, tools and platforms, and we're ready to take this to the next level. Uh, what we found is that using satellite to uh, obtain actual crop ETC for the field is the best way to get field water use. While we've learned through the acquisition of PeerSense that uh, soil moisture probes are the best at determining the optimum time and duration of irrigation events. Uh, as a result, bringing these together we've been able to provide growers in the West optimized irrigation schedules. We've been able to use 15 years of soil moisture data along with the newly available machine learning tools to run this optimized irrigation schedule through this irrigation 
controllers that we have, and those are in the center of the screen, we have a whole suite of irrigation controllers from a, a single pump and valve controller all the way up to 48 station valve controls. Uh, with these tools, we are ready for closed loop autonomous irrigation using satellite, soil moisture, weather, this computation, analysis, and then the machine learning, sending irrigation schedules automatically uh, to the controllers. Well, this works primarily for uh, been on drip irrigation. We've also been focused on center pivot irrigation and br working towards bringing these solutions to autonomous irrigation. Our industry-leading center pivot application product called the Jane Genesis is the industry's first and only smart sprinkler that through radio we can send irrigation commands for rotation speed, amount of water, and real time. The Jane Genesis allows us to uh, provide water output to a sprinkler from 0 to 20 gallons per minute on a sprinkler, variable rate droplet size, patterns from 10 to 25 feet, and we can control uh, up to 150 sprinklers and I'm going to attempt to run this slide. You can see that the, these are individually controlled sprinklers, and you can see the different pattern sizes, the amount of flow out of each sprinkler here, and you can individually control these sprinklers as the pivot's moving through the field. You see that sprinkler on the, as we go further left, the, the revolutions get faster, the radius gets tighter, and there's actually less water. So. Uh, in in the, the cost profile that we're looking at, you're able to get very low cost, complete variable rate technology uh, from these uh, sprinklers. So we're pretty excited about the analytics that we have, the control applications, and then being able to bring this to center pivot technology. Next summer will be our fifth year of field trials for the Jane Genesis sprinkler, and we look forward to sharing uh, future updates on this product as well. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Eric. Okay, so we've just done a whirlwind of a bunch of speakers and so that we can all sort of take a step back, kind of start absorb and not get too overwhelmed by so much information, we're going to go live to the field with Rurik for just a moment here as a mini break before we dive back into the next section of the lightning round. So turning it over to you, Rourke. Thanks, Amy. I promise you a connected farm. And quite frankly, uh, this, is, this is groundbreaking. Uh, Page uh, Wireless has provided a, a low end network here at the farm, which I'm actually sitting in my cab, which Jerry was just watching a series of Yellowstone before we got here. But, this is literally sitting uh, in the cab of our combine, getting ready to go uh, for the spring, or excuse me, not for spring, but for harvest, uh, getting ahead of myself already. Uh, but the planning and the process and the connectivity is significant. So anyway, that's just a, that's a snapshot from Connected uh, Acre. Amy, back to you. Thanks, Rourke. He's going to take us somewhere else on the farm later, so we'll look forward to that. And I want to thank all of the speakers so far. You've done an excellent job of doing these lightning rounds on, on uh, providing so much content in such a concise way. Um, you really set the stage and, uh, and the bar <laughs> for, for how this is going, so thank you so much. Uh, we're going to turn to uh, a slightly different approach of folks that um, from the research side now. Susie, if you can go ahead and uh, start sharing your screen again with the PowerPoint. We'll start with the next group of lightning round speakers. So uh, while we're getting ready to do that, we've got um, just Andrew, we'll just queue you up and make sure your mic is good. So we've got An Andrew Newsom with Augmenta, who's speaking first. All right, great. Y'all hear me okay? Yes, I can. Yeah. All right. Uh, and we can go straight to slide two if you want to start off there. So, uh, so giving me three minutes is, is, is rough. I'm a, I'm a slow talker. So, uh, I, I figured we'll start off with a video. So we'll let the video do the primary, uh, portion of the talking and, uh, let me, uh, sum up the rest. So if we can go to slide two. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you.
Do you guys have sound? I don't have sound. Yeah, no, I don't have sound either. Let's see. Oh, sorry. It's because I was muted. Okay. <laughs> it is estimated that by 2050, there will be a 70% increase in food demand due to population growth. Almost 90% of world's population depends on agriculture. More than ever, there is an imminent need to maximize field production. Farming is fairly considered to be one of the most challenging jobs on earth. A typical farmer today is using mainly his personal experience to provide us with food of high quality and in adequate quantities. Today's practices, though, do not evolve efficiently. But technology does. Augmenta's powerful plug-and-play hardware, along with its machine learning and vision technology, was created by farmers for farmers, offering real-time field scanning and instant agricultural machinery control with never-seen-before precision. This user-friendly, state-of-the-art device ensures that every inch of the farm receives the exact amount of input that will make it reach its full potential and substantially augment the income of the farmer. At the end of the day, all the actionable field data are stored and visualized to a personal and secure web platform where the farmer has unlimited access. Augmenta offers yield production increase up to 12%, fertilizer savings up to 15%, product quality improvement up to 20%. Augmenta's goal is to improve the quality of farmer's life, protect the environment from excessive chemical use, and contribute to the meeting of increasing food demands. Augmenta, precision agriculture redefined. All right, and if we can go to the next slide, that'd be fantastic. So, okay, so that was a lot of information really quick. Uh, but that's what's going to help me meet my three minute timeline today. Uh, so, um, as the video said, our big focus is making sure that we are making our partners money. Okay, and the way that we're going to do that is we're going to do that by um, looking at the inputs that we're putting on the uh, plant growth regulators, uh, defoliants, um, um, and uh, uh, in uh, fertilizer as well. And so basically the way that we do that is our sensor is actually mounted on top of your sprayer. Uh, it looks out 120 feet in front of you and um, optimizes each dosage uh, for, that, uh, for, for that particular acre. Um, and really what makes us special over some of our, our competing uh, uh, tech and uh, is that we don't require um, a, a, a um, nitrogen-rich check strip, uh, which is a, a um, kind of novel theme. Uh, we we uh, also will um, uh, work on work about uh, work on just about any um, sprayer or spreader out there. Uh, even if you don't have a control system, we can actually um, put a control system on. And basically, basically right now, our biggest our biggest um, a uh, challenge with this is uh, is COVID actually not getting us out on the farms, uh, but with these digital field days, we're we're actually able to get in, get in touch with people and talk to you. So, thank you, Rourke, for the time. Great. Um. Thanks. Turning to Laura and Layla from the University of Nebraska. Great. You can go ahead to the next slide. Can you jump to the next slide, Susie? Um, so sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so sorry, I uh, didn't have time to load. Uh, there were two presenters I didn't have time to load in, so I'm just pulling up their PowerPoint on my, uh, on my screen real fast, and then I will share that. Okay, great, thanks. So sorry. Uh, can people see this or? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool, great. 
Alright, uh, so I'm just gonna make this a little bit bigger. Try. Okay. Alright, uh, go ahead, uh, Laura. It's great, thank you. You can go on to the next slide. Um, so this project, we're going to be talking about um, a nitrogen management project. This effort was launched in 2020 to connect corn and wheat producers across Nebraska with access to cutting edge technologies through on-farm research. So our goal is for producers to get hands-on experience with new technologies to manage nitrogen more efficiently and evaluate how these technologies will work on their own operations. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this project is made possible through a $1.2 million grant through the USDA NRCS uh, Conservation Innovation Trials Grant. So we're really excited to have received this, um, this funding to help uh, with this project. Next slide, please. Um, so our specific objectives, um, the first we're going to try to demonstrate and increase adoption of precision agriculture technologies that are using data-driven, real-time, and site-specific in-season nitrogen recommendation techniques. And to do that, we'll be conducting 120 randomized and replicated on-farm trials um, to compare these innovative approaches. And this will be done as part of the Nebraska On-Farm Research Network that we have in Nebraska, supported by our Corn Board, our Soybean Board, and our Dry Bean Commission. Um, next slide, please. Um, so as part of these trials, we're going to evaluate agronomic, economic, environmental, and social impact. So really cross-cutting evaluation, um, looking at things like the yield, the soil, the nitrogen efficiency, partial profit. Uh, we'll share results through a variety of, of traditional and innovative methods like video, um, interactive decision tools, and things like that. Next slide. Um, so I just wanted to go over briefly our, our kind of four general topics and study options for this project. Next slide. Uh, so the first is looking at crop model based tools for corn nitrogen management. You can see several examples there from Mason, Adaptin, Climate Field View, Granular, Farmer's Edge, Fluorosat, and more. And you can see kind of some screenshots from some of those different platforms. So this project, uh, this first option here is going to help producers get familiarity with working with some of those. Um, finding out how they work on their own farms. Um, next slide. The second option that we have here is looking at crop canopy sensing for corn nitrogen management. So you can see an image here of our high clearance applicator with crop canopy sensors mounted on the front. Um, so that's, that's an option that producers will have is to use different crop canopy sensing technologies to manage corn nitrogen. Next slide. The third one that we're offering here is nitrification inhibitors on corn. And this actually um, is a little bit broader. We're looking at inhibitors for urea, UAN, anhydrous, and ammonium nitrate. So a variety of different products that could help um, producers manage nitrogen more efficiently. And then our fourth one is looking at wheat applications or nitrogen applications on wheat. And so we actually have a variety here ranging from split applications of nitrogen to crop canopy sensing, also looking at slow release fertilizers on wheat, and then looking at aerial imagery to uh, drive nitrogen management on wheat as well. Uh, so a variety there on wheat for our fourth topic. Uh, the next slide. Um, I just want to point out the great team that we have working on this. It's really an interdisciplinary effort. We have five specialists working on topics from soil fertility, precision ag, uh, spatial economics, as well as 13 extension educators spread throughout the, straight, the state to really uh, implement this on farmers fields around the state with those 120 on farm research trials. Um, next slide. So I'm going to turn over to Lila. She's going to share about the pilot studies that we have for this project on Rorix Farm. Thank you, Laura. Um, so yeah, quickly, we're going to show you two examples of our pilot of this project that we did with Rorix this summer. So for this experiment, we have two sites, uh, one dry land where we use popcorn and one irrigated corn. Next. So uh, the objective here was comparing two different software platforms that are crop model based to make uh, advising of nitrogen during the growing season. So in this example, what I'm showing you is uh, two different models. One is the granular, um, and another one is Adaptin from Yara Company. 
So you can see those in pink and blue um, doing, um, in both layouts, the dry land and irrigated. And then one aspect of this project that we are really excited about is that those two um, softwares and you know, the nitrogen rate that they apply is gonna be compared to our optimal nitrogen rate uh, from that particular uh, site by uh, implementing different nitrogen blocks throughout the, the field that will allow us at the end of the season calculate the yield response to nitrogen. Next. So this is just in a screenshot of the work that we're doing. So compiling a lot of information from yield monitor data, soil data, any kind of mapping that in this case Rodit had available from these, uh, these fields, we come up with a a prescription working very closely with the industry partners. We came up with the two prescriptions. Next. So, um, and after a lot of cookie cutter and like assembling the experiment, we were able to put a, a, a laid out of the prescription that then Roddy can easily get into the uh, monitor of the applicator and implement an experiment that would allow to, com to compare these two technologies side by side. Next. This is the same example, but for the irrigated field, um, not getting into the details, but this was really exciting to see how the crop models were able to capture the two different contrasting uh, uh, conditions. Next. So this is again, uh, um, kind of like showing you the, the different layout that we have for the irrigated field uh, in the pivot and kind of like the advantage of using Precision Act technology to come up with this complex design in the field. Next. This is a few uh, screenshot of one of the travels that I did to the site in the summer. I just wanna mention that we're collecting moisture sensors and temperature uh, readings in both of the sites. So in the picture on the left, you can really see the two environments, the far in the back, that's the irrigated field being irrigated at that point. And then I'm standing on the dry land. Uh, so really uh, one advantage is crop models are able to capture all these contrasting conditions in the field and, and, and give a very adjusted nitrogen rate. Next. So uh, really this is um, an example. Laura, do you wanna comment on it? Sure, I can say this one. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I just wanted to um, mention to the group here we have today that we are you know, looking for farmer cooperators to be involved in these studies as well as uh, industry collaborators. So if you're interested in being a part of this project that we're describing here, uh, please let us know. Um, next. Um, we also have several positions. So I just wanted to share these in case you know of people that are interested, but we do have two research technologist positions that will be working on this project, as well as currently a graduate student that uh, we have a position open to be working on this. Um, so next slide. Um, I just shared the link here, but I will put that in the chat. So if you want any more information on this project, um, you can contact us or go to that site. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Thanks, Laura, Laura and Lila. Okay, Santosh, we're coming to you. Sounds good. All right, my name is uh, Santosh Pitla. I'm an associate professor in biological systems engineering. Uh, my research is focused on machine systems, automation, and agricultural robotics. Uh, so next slide, please. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, this one right here. Well, uh, so we know we have made uh, tremendous advances in terms of sensing, data collection. I think we are at a point where we know everything about corn, right? So uh, the, the corn is going to demand more water, fertilizer, and we have to take care of the weeds, right? So you might be getting a call, a text, or a tweet from your corn plant. Uh, so so I think that is, this, uh, that is the amount of technology we have today, but how do we tend to the requirements of these plants? So we are in an IoT ecosystem, right? So, so one of the solutions that uh, my research group is working on is how does the next generation of um, autonomous machinery, ag machinery going to look like? Uh, so, so these are some of the platforms that we have at uh, the Biological Systems Engineering. Uh, we are on the East Campus. Uh, we have something, little robots that can go in, in between the crop rows, uh, like the ones you see at the bottom left. 
So these two can go in between the con rows and do a population count for you. And one of the research we're looking into is, can we uh, record the solar radiation um, and also uh, sense the microclimate, you know, related to humidity and temperature. Um, and then these platforms here are, we're exploring multi-robot cooperation strategies uh, before we put it on bigger machines. Uh, so they'll allow you to understand who's the leader, who's the follower. Again, these are all autonomous. Uh, so they need to maybe be making their own decision. Uh, how, who's the leader, who's the follower for different types of operations. So, so that's what we are looking at with these red platforms. And the one on the right is a more practical field platform. Uh, this is a 60 horsepower machine. And as you can notice in all these machines, we are talking about um, autonomy for a while now, but um, existing tractors are excellent. But if you are going to go the autonomy route, we don't need the cab, the air conditioning. So, right. So, so that's why you see there's no cab here. Um, so that's what we're looking at on the machinery side of things. Um, and this platform has a canvas system uh, and it's high clearance. Um, you, it's uh, around five feet of clearance. So you can get through the crop rows in season um, and do some sensing. Um, so I'm going to post some videos uh, of these machines in the chat box uh, where you can see uh, we actually tested the 60 horsepower machine uh, in our research field, uh, trying to for phenotyping operation. But since it's 60 horsepower, we can do two row planting, we can do spot spraying. Again, these robots would be important if you think about uh, targeted weeding um, and also use it as ground truthing machines, right? So with all the uh, big data and ground truth uh, models are, are going to be very important. So, so these machines can be actually be in the field 20 hours a day and uh, looking for problems and reporting the problems and even taking care of the problems. Uh, so, so this is uh, the one of my visions is, you know, these autonomous systems and with the drones being used uh, uh, and becoming a norm today, you know, there could be, you know, the drones could be flying over and looking at the bigger picture but then they are communicating with ground robots to take care of things. And connectivity is a big piece here. Uh, so like Rorik mentioned about, uh, you know, the connectivity, we are getting there, right? So once connectivity is there, then what are we, uh, what uh, are the other things that we can do? Uh, so a lot of these automated machines require a lot of computing. So we could be thinking about some edge computing aspects, but also a lot of intelligence need to be happening on the machine too. So, so that's kind of, uh, the overall uh, vision we have for, you know, uh, developing uh, autonomous systems and agricultural robotics. So thank you. Thanks. Wonderful. On to you, Joe. All right. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. All right. Well, let's get, get right into it. Um, so I appreciate the opportunity to, to visit with the group. If we could go back one slide, I think, um, Susie. Um, sorry, I was, um, just to save some time with everybody. I took out like the intro and the thank yous. Okay. No problem. Are, um, so I'll just. Yeah. Sorry. Well, yeah. Thanks again for the opportunity to share. So I just wanted to highlight some of the, the work that we're doing in, uh, I think Laura and Lila really covered a lot of what we try to do in, in the program. Um, in the digital ag program at the University of Nebraska. And one of the areas that we've been working in a lot the last few years gets, gets towards nitrogen management tools. And um, Lila has a expertise in the modeling side and, and Laura on the sensing side. And that's a lot of what we try and work on these days is uh, kind of the overlap between the two. And so a lot of folks may be familiar with Project Sense that's been an ongoing project. Laura mentioned it, the active crop canopy sensor based technique that we're uh, working with the CIG grant. But using uh, sensor based information to, to drive responsive crop management in season, um, we've probably covered over 4,000 acres since 2015 with that project, uh, almost to the point where we can start to give people an idea of where based on their field characteristics, where these types of technologies are actually gonna, gonna have a better opportunity of paying back 
um, environmentally and economically. So uh, we've been working in that area for quite some time. Um, this is just another example in the upper right, the, the SENSE project, I'm using a lot of ag data to conduct that, uh, that project and from an analysis perspective. I mentioned the, the aerial imagery piece of that. You can see an example there in the bottom left of how we're, we're working with that information. Again, focusing on you know, in-season decisions that the producers can make to try and have a positive effect. Uh, we've also started here in the last couple of years through different partnerships working with uh, fertigation, so applying nitrogen through the pivot, which is a very uh, Nebraska-focused issue, um, but again, uh, something that has a lot of potential impact. So we can go on, Susie. I, I'm preaching to the choir here, but um, everybody understands the need for faster connectivity, cloud storage and computing tools. Santosh just mentioned um, edge computing, so we maybe not have to work on, uh, you know, transmitting data in that fashion every time. But, but there's no piece of the crop production cycle that can't be digitized today, essentially. And so this is just a very high overview example of how that how that can work. Um, everything that we do out in the field in, in some way, shape or form can be digitized and, and, and utilized from that perspective. So the uh, several things, and I think Santosh might have touched on a couple of these, but several things are driving the need for digital farming or farm of the future, I think is kind of the term I like to use. Uh, if you think about where we are today in terms of digital agriculture, the ability to collect data, uh, process data, and, and push that to an actionable item, we're almost able to do that in, in every way. The second step, and I think we've heard one speaker talk about this, is the, the artificial intelligence component. If we are going to truly move to a fully autonomous farm, we have to have artificial intelligence to make the decisions. And maybe maybe somebody like Rorick does a double check on that, but um, but that part of the process, it's not just about making uh, or running data through algorithms. It's actually, you know, telling, telling people where to go and what to do, uh, when and so forth. And that moves us into the fully autonomous system. And that gets right to where Santosh is talking about uh, with the autonomous field equipment. So activating that equipment to go out and perform a task autonomously. So we have to have all these pieces interconnected. And, and right now it seems like the, the AI piece of that and the uh, connectivity with autonomous equipment is where the most of the work kind of lies. So. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. And so one of the concepts that we're pushing hard for at the university is development of what we might call farm of the future or smart farm. But um, in other words, we are you very unique across the country in the fact that we can span so many different climatic regions. And the, again, the, the need to have the data digitized to push that into a system where we can have real-time analytics, real-time artificial intelligence running on that to, to drive decisions in the field that can be deployed autonomously. Um, I think that's something that we are really excited to try and focus on. And just thinking about how industry can plug into that effort, I think is, uh, is very exciting from sensors, algorithms, crop modeling, uh, you, you name it, there's so much in there that, that uh, we could team up with folks and, and get good information out of. So that's something that we're really excited about, just the ability, just consider the ability of autonomous equipment to do, um, you know, Lila mentioned the, uh, I think the cookie cutter, of how, to, how to include test strips with with variable, app, variable rate application strips, just imagine the ability of uh, autonomous equipment to, to fully deploy and, and get data for us every year to test all these different uh, solu potential solutions and products that are out there. So um, that's something we're excited to try and move forward with and, and hopefully we'll be able to have some significant progress in the next year or two. So appreciate the opportunity to share. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Yu Feng, you're next. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. 
Hi, good, mor uh, good morning, everyone. So my name is Yu Fang Ge, and I am also an associate professor with the Biological Systems Engineering Department with the university. So Susan, you can uh, advance. And uh, today I would uh, like to uh, talk about the two projects that's going on uh, in my lab. So the first project is the rapid soil carbon analysis for agricultural lands. So we have been collaborating with the USDA and RCS at Lincoln and they have a very large legacy soil archive containing over um, maybe 200,000 soil samples all over the US uh, in the history. So a significant, a significant part of this archive has been scanned with a near infrared and the mid infrared instruments. And in the hope to develop a rapid and a robust predictive models for variable, var various soil properties. So on the left of the slides you see there, that's the highlight. Right. Go back. Uh, some of the results, the research. So with the uh, modeling uh, of the meta infrared uh, modeling, so you can see that even at the national scale, soil carbon can be predicted very accurately with this approach and with the fraction of the cost compared to the conventional wet chemistry analysis. And our lab also developed an instrumented soil penetrometer system. So this system continuously measure near infrared reflectance and the penetration resistance and the penetration depths and a few other parameters as the penetrometer is pushed into the soil. And so from these sensor measurement, we can infer a number of soil properties such as particle size, moisture, carbon contents, and the bulk density. So we are collaborating with the Soil Health Institute and we will be receiving funding from DOE's RPAE uh, program, the Smart Farm program to further develop this system to measure soil carbon stock and potentially uh, carbon flux for agricultural lands with affordable uh, price. Next slide. So the second project is the, the IoT development. So to develop distributed wireless sensor network on farm for real time crop and soil monitoring. So, uh, so we, we so as an engineer, we strive to develop systems from scratch. So we use off the shelf, low cost sensors and in order to bring the overall cost down. And the sensor measures soil moisture content in the multi-spectral reflectance and the uh, crop uh, and the RGB images as well. So we, uh, we designed and fabricated the hardware from the beginning and developed the software codes by our own. So in this past season, we were able to construct 11 of these sensor nodes and test in one field at the East Nebraska Research and Extension Center. So it's a, a small network uh, that you show here uh, with a low log gateway set up in the farmhouse and uh, with 11 sensor nodes that communicate via low, low protocol to the gateway and from there, the data transferred to a cloud server database, which is driven by the MATLAB things the IoT analytics platform. So I also put some uh, sort of example data sets from this network here. So you see the images of soybean canopy uh, over, over the season and also um, some of the time uh, track, the, the long-term monitoring of the NDVI and the, the optical properties of the uh, canopies uh, visualized through the SingSpeak platform. So that's all I want to cover. So if you have questions, feel free to uh, get the message in the chat and I will reply. Thank you. Thank you. Up next is Darren Rudnick. Susie, Darren would like to share his screen. Yeah, absolutely. I apologize, I was a little behind sending my slides in. No, no worries. All right, can everyone see the slides? We can. Perfect. Well, uh, for one, uh, thanks for work and Crystal for the opportunity to share a program that we started back in 2017. This kind of start off with, I want to uh, acknowledge some of the uh, members of the team that developed the TAPS program. So Chuck Burr, I believe he's also on today, uh, Matt Stockton, Ag Economist. And then we have uh, Rodrigo Worley, who has departed uh, to University of Wisconsin, but um, and so many others. 
the thing that we wanted to share with today would be the TAPS farm management competitions. And this started back with conversations in 2017 that we were having on how do we best engage growers around efficient and profitable uh, production practices. And through conversations with Rorick and his colleagues at Nuba, we kind of came up with this idea of, well, how do we get everybody to one location and kind of the topic of competition came up. And so through that, we've actually started and have made quite a bit of headway in terms of how we run these competitions. But in essence, what we're doing is trying to get everybody together. And so providing them an opportunity to compete against their peers in a very controlled environment. And that provides us a couple different uh, benefits. So one, we're able to evaluate the outcomes of that competition because we're going to have the same soil, the same equipment that administers uh, the decisions that are being made. Uh, we're all regulated in terms of uh, who's doing the management practices and we can treat it like a research experiment. And then also one of the benefits of it is we can engage our industry um, colleagues and provide a lot of instrumentation and tools and resources to put at the fingertips of our growers. And so just wanted to kind of share a few things here. Um, so as I mentioned, one of the things we do with this competition is we treat it as a research experiment. So this is our uh, two of our five competitions that are going on right now. Uh, this would be here in uh, North Platte, Nebraska. And so the idea is each team, uh, which is made up of individual growers or groups of growers, would get one randomized plot in blocks A, B, and C for their competition. And then they provide their recommendations in real time uh, to us. And then our uh, project team actually administers those decisions. And so it is a lengthy um, uh, competition. So the teams start out in February, and then we have our banquet in either December or January. But the cool thing that we get to do is we get to provide access to a lot of instrumentation for those growers so that they can really play around in a risk-free environment and they don't have any consequence to their own operation. So they get the access to imagery, uh, whether it's drone or satellite or aerial, um, nitrogen models, irrigation scheduling tools. Uh, we put edge of field uh, weather stations out there, um, plant sensors like the arable marks and soil moisture monitoring. And then we come on top and collect a bunch of research quality data using our neutron attenuation. Uh, we work with our commercial lab, uh, ward laboratories, so we can do biomass and uh, nutrient uptake information. And we scout the fields and we provide all that information to the growers as well as our industry contacts. Uh, the program, we've had over uh, 200 plus growers that have directly competed in the competition. And we've had over 60 partners and sponsors that have really made this possible. And we've been very fortunate to be partnering with uh, the Nebraska Water Balance Alliance, uh, Ogallala Water, which is our uh, USDA funded project. And we recently received a, a grant through NRCS. And then one of the really exciting parts is we've had tremendous support from our commodity boards. I believe Boone is here on the call and we'll be talking later, um, as well as our uh, sorghum uh, board and the checkoff. And lastly, the nice thing is, even though it's being uh, conducted right there in North Platte or in Sydney, Nebraska, or down in the panhandle of Oklahoma with uh, Jason Warren and his colleagues, we are able to have growers coming from all over to compete in these competitions because, as Joe mentioned, we do live in a digital world. And so the data can be in real time accessed in those fields and they can make those decisions and rely on those resources. So thank you guys for the opportunity to share. Thank you, Darren. Um, in the interest of time, we were going to have a mini break now, but we're going to carry on with our next speaker. Um, Paul, are you there? Susie will start sharing. Uh, yes, I am. Can you hear me okay? Oh, yeah, your audio is terrific. That's great. If you don't mind, Susie's going to share this, her uh, the screen again, and, and we'll keep rolling. Awesome. Well, uh, while she does that, I'll, I'll introduce myself and uh, Paul Welbig with, with Raven Industries. And uh, I did provide a few slides uh, ahead of time. I'm not sure if you got them in time. There you go. Um, and so uh, again, thanks for uh, allowing me to join this panel here this morning and excited to share a few things about Raven and kind of the technology and vision that we have going forward. And uh, a lot of people may know Raven as um, 
you know, we've been in the industry a long time, spray controllers, sprayer controls, things like that. But we do have a broad suite of products and technologies and solutions that um, go above and beyond that. And so I'm going to share uh, primarily focus on just a couple areas today, but <clears throat> kind of as the slide states there, our goal is to provide ag professionals that are looking to improve their business um, to create and integrate uh, technology solutions to help increase efficiency, improve accuracy, reduce variability, and maximize your bottom line. So it, we're really about you know, that profitability and technology and solutions that are, are pretty broad based um, um, for those operations, whether you're an ag retailer, a grower, a custom applicator, those types of things. And a couple of areas that we, we I wanted to focus on today our, our, uh, our uh, slingshot solution, which is our uh, data connectivity and logistics platform that's made up of several products and solutions depicted by this uh, visual that's on the right here. So um, kind of starting from the upper left there is connectivity, which is where a lot of this starts, right? And just having that internet connectivity in the field uh, is very important. And we've been doing this for about 10 years uh, working in very challenging rural areas where you might not be able to make a cell phone call, but we are able to provide at least some level of connectivity on the farm. And once we establish that connection, which we don't take for granted, um, it's, it's about being able to, you know, what can we do with that? And you've heard a lot of solutions today um, uh, that are remarkable and really awesome. And, uh, you know, kind of how we serve that up is, is we do offer different solutions for that, such as logistics. We do have some analytical capabilities, reports, and we serve them up through various uh, web applications as well as mobile apps. So Slingshot for, for us and uh, for our customers is this connected ecosystem um, a solution for, for those customers. And so what we find is when we're able to, you know, provide that complete end-to-end -end solution of you know software and hardware and integration through that that customers start to realize enormous efficiency gains. Uh, we on average we see approximately 20%. Uh, honestly, a lot more in some cases and sometimes a little bit less, but on average it's at least 20% inefficiency uh, uh, gains uh, through that. And so that's kind of our, like I said, our data and connectivity platform and kind of as we continue to grow that, it's, it just continues to grow as we become uh, more connected in the rural areas, as well as just the different applications that we're able to leverage uh, in the technology. So the next uh, exciting thing that uh, I wanted to talk about is autonomy. And so many people may know, may not know that uh, we launched a Raven autonomy strategy about a year ago. And the, the, the challenge that we have is as the average age of the farmer increases and the available uh, labor on the farm decreases, the need for more efficient utilization of resources continues to increase. And autonomy will allow the, a single operator to perform more functions simultaneously. So our, our goal is not to remove you know, workforce or anything like that. We're just trying to answer the challenge where hey, there is a void, we do need to uh, uh, still get these things done and, and build solutions that it can actually be applied and, and uh, enabled by maybe less, uh, less people than, than before. And so this uh, allowed for more control, um, optimization, all those types of things. And we're building out a portfolio of solutions that will enable more autonomous operation on the farm. And so obviously there's a lot of benefits to that, uh, allow for 24 seven operations. Um, and, and then, like I said, just kind of start to automate a lot of the things that today are, are challenging based on uh, the work environment and the challenges in the field and, and so on and so forth. So that's our strategy. Uh, Raven acquired a couple companies last year in DOT, which is a uh, you know autonomous drive unit platform based out of Regina, Saskatchewan. And then we we also acquired uh, the company called SmartAg uh, based out of Ames, Iowa, which are now also a part of the Raven team, as well as building out a portfolio technology 
that uh, we, we have at Raven. So uh, the first big project or the big product, I would say solution that we've rolled out is called AutoCart. Uh, it's the first driverless platform on the market. Um, and as you see here in the picture, it depicts, you know, uh, basically a automated grain cart that the, uh, that the combine operator can summon and there's no driver in the cab of that uh, ADAR uh, John Deere tractor. He pulls alongside, or it, I should say, pulls alongside the, the, uh, the combine and then it auto uh, unloads into, into the, uh, the grain cart and then it, it drives itself back to the, the semi where then it's unloaded and so on and so forth. And so uh, we also have other capabilities that we're able to do, but this is a commercially viable solution today. We're in the field testing at the moment and uh, we are gonna be rolling this out on a commercial basis uh, within the next six months. So it's, it's very near, very close, lots going on, especially this time of year. We're pretty excited to, to launch that. So um, I do have a video I could share, but I, in the sake of time, I could um, you know, maybe provide that afterwards. You can watch that, but it is pretty fascinating to see how these machines can operate autonomously and, and provide those solutions um, and, and how close to commercialization we have uh, we can bring these things to market sooner than maybe what anybody had thought even just a year ago. So that's all I had, but just wanted to thank everybody for the time. Wonderful. Thank you, Paul. Alan, you're up next. All right. This Su Susie, do you have the, I, I only have one slide. Yep. All right. Thank you. My name is Alan Andales. I'm a professor at Colorado State University in the area of irrigation and water science. And I serve as the principal investigator for the Irrigation Innovation Consortium. So I'll, I'll just take this opportunity to introduce or give an overview of the consortium. I've been involved and interacted with Warwick uh, through the Ogallala coordinated agricultural project working on irrigation scheduling tools. So I, I appreciate this opportunity to speak uh, related to Rorick's farm. Now the, the Irrigation Innovation Consortium provides an opportunity, future opportunity, I guess, for further interacting with Rorick and all the other producers as well as industry. The IIC for short is a collaborative research effort to accelerate the development and adoption of water and energy efficient irrigation technologies and practices. And we, we try to do this through a public-private partnership. And I, I thought that the best way of giving you an overview is just giving you a diagram. So this is how the, the IIC works. There's university partners which provide their individual research capacities and strengths. And the, we partner with irrigation companies who bring in manufacturing, marketing, and specific uh, capacities in terms of services. And these irrigation companies, they probably have their core business either in agriculture, in landscape, irrigation, or both. And then we also need to consider allied industries where we use their platforms such as tech companies, telecom, energy to run these uh, irrigation technologies. Now we try to identify what we call white space research areas and hopefully you can see those four main areas that I listed. So of course water and energy efficiency is key. Then we have remote sensing and big data system integration and management, and finally, uh, with rela related to outreach, is acceleration and adoption of these technologies. Now, the funding agency right now that we have is uh, the Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research. And uh, up on the upper right-hand corner of this slide, you'll see the, the funding mechanism where FAR has committed uh, $5 million through uh, five years 
we started in 2018. And this allows us to match the federal dollars from FAR with a one-to-one -one match from university or private sources. And this essentially, this essentially, um, this essentially uh, doubles the investment of a university or private partner and then allowing us to conduct collaborative research and deliver that to stakeholders. So at the bottom of the slide is the, the website for the Irrigation Innovation Consortium. So just uh, look at that for, for additional information. And I'd just like to mention that we do have a request for proposals that comes out every year. And we're looking to put that out uh, late, later this year, probably in November or December this year. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Okay. Thomas, turn to you. Yeah, thank you. So thanks for inviting me to talk a little bit about some of the work that especially Colorado State University in collaboration with the University of Cincinnati, Professor Dean's group has done as a part of a newly funded uh, National Alliance for Water Quality. Um, this presentation has also some input from the National Alliance for Water Innovation Executive Director, Peter Fisk from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And uh, one of the things that we have been thinking a lot about uh, is the potential for treatment and reuse of non-traditional water for agricultural irrigation. So why treat and reuse non-traditional water for ag? Well, I'm talking to the choir here, but Freshwater scarcity is what well, back please. Freshwater scarcity is of course one of the drivers why we might have to move from freshwater to other sources in the future. Increasing freshwater costs, stricter water quality regulations, especially as it relates to potentially nutrient load from controlled drainage into surface waters, and then of course increasing fertilizer costs. Next. So what are uh, some good examples of potential non-traditional water sources. That's something we're thinking a lot about as, as we're developing a roadmap for, for treatment and reuse of waters in the future. Tile drainage could be one. Braggish water could be a non-traditional water source. The use of municipal wastewater, produce water from oil and gas, or even use uh, meat processing water for ag agricultural irrigation. Thank you. Next. So um, here's just one example uh, for tile drainage. So the tile drainage reuse goal would be to basically transform a linear model into a circular water system. So what do we need, mean with that? Um, as, as pointed out in a recent paper by our research director, Megan Water and Peter Fisk, they're saying that a linear water economy must evolve into a resilient circular water economy where water is continuously reused and contaminants or nutrients becomes the feedstock for the other economically valuable processes. So if you're thinking about a linear process right now, it's indicated down here for, for uh, agricultural irrigation, we have water coming into an applied field via precipitation, irrigation, groundwater, and so forth. Some of it is being used to grow crop crops. Some is lost via evapotranspiration. Some of that excess water then drains through the soil, it leaves via surface runoff. Um, and some of it is basically wasted, such to speak, into the surface water. Next. The idea is to not lose all the water into surface uh, streams and so forth, but rather recycle the water via some treatment, reuse that wastewater and recycle the nutrients um, at the field level through tailwater recovery systems. Next, please. Of course, uh, if we are in California where the water is way more salty, these processes of, of treatment and reuse for uh, irrigation would require much more advanced technology. So in that case, we are thinking about developing more sophisticated technologies where you maybe combine a bioreactor for ultrafiltration and reverse osmosis that then will allow for recycling uh, the tile drainage water for agricultural irrigation. Obviously that will lead to a lot of salt that needs to be managed afterwards, but um, those are some of the thoughts that we have. Next. Obviously one of the big challenges when you start to treat and reuse water of non uh, from non-traditional sources is, imagine we are treating and reusing oil, oil uh, produced water, right? Um, how much do we need to treat this water in order to uh, reapply it in a way to sustain uh, agriculture? 
This paper here we published last year, for example, showed that if you treated uh, produced water and used it for irrigation, that it had some surprising uh, impacts. In this case, we actually saw that the water quality as it decreased, it also resulted in a decreased immune response for uh, the, wheat, the wheat field that we were um, irrigating. Next, please. So that's where NAVI comes in, the National Alliance for Water Innovation. So to, to support development of technology and reuse options for agricultural water, we were recently sponsored by the Department of Energy's Advanced Manufacturing Office for five years with a $105 million grant. And the goal for this $105 million grant is to secure a resilient 21st century water supply through distributed desalination and reuse. And uh, 19 universities and four national labs that are a part of this. And we have a lot of Alliance member and all of you can sign up to become an Alliance member as well. Next, please. So how are we going to basically develop cost-effective water treatment and reuse plans? As a part of this proposal, um, several A prime, that's what we refer to, A prime elements was developed in order to reach uh, cost-effective water treatment. And as we have heard earlier today, autonomous operation is a big part of it. Sensor development, adaptive process control for efficient, resilient, and secure systems, precision separation, where we maybe take out pollutants and separate fertilizer that we can re reapply to an agricultural field. We need a resilient treatment and transport system. We need, of course, when you, when you treat salty water, intensive fire brine management, and we need to develop modular membrane systems that can be adjusted depending on seasonal variability. And we want to move towards electrified treatment processes to lower energy footprints. Next. And so by applying all these A prime elements, we hope to uh, meet the goal of a circular water economy that delivers pipe parity. What that means is that as we develop all this technology that we by applying all of these elements we hope that the cost of this water that is resulting from treating non-traditional water uh, will meet more or less the price of, of corn and freshwater um, sources. Next, please. And so this is the final slide. We have a lot of collaborators and I invite you to go into www.navihub.org and sign up and register your interest so you can become a Navi Alliance member and think about how to provide water in the future. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thanks. And Rob, we're going to turn to you. Rob Harrington, you're next. One second. Thank you. Um, I think I have two pictures. Oops, sorry. Slides that I sent you. <clears throat> I'm so sorry. I, I, I know that um, these are your two slides. I, I just think I missed your, your name card. Um, All right. I'm Rob Harrington, and uh, I'm the founder and uh, CEO of a little company called Prairie Food. Uh, we incorporated in 2016. Uh, what our goal and objective is, is to provide a path and a transition from using synthetic fertilizers uh, to not using synthetic, synthetic fertilizers anymore and working with Mother Nature by putting enough carbon in the right formats down that uh, synthetics are no longer needed. So if you could go back to the first slide there, uh, if you would, please. Um, Prairie Food is, is, is all about carbon, and uh, our product, which is uh, it's derived by a hydrothermal process, is taking waste biomasses and uh, deconstructing it down to the molecular level into two forms of carbon, soluble and insoluble carbon. The soluble type carbon, obviously, is what the microbes love to eat, and the insoluble carbon, which is about 30% of our product, is uh, sequestrable. So uh, what we're attempting to do is allow, allow farmers and ag around the world to migrate over time to uh, a different method. And one thing that we were being able to do here is utilize the carbon and not emit it. Uh, our product significantly uh, 
improve soil health. Uh, since we're organically bound with the nutrients in, in our product, uh, we no longer have volatilization or greenhouse gases coming off or our, our product is no longer modal in water. So it stays in the soil where it's supposed to be feeding the microbe population. And one of the things that we were very fortunate of is we've been able to produce this product in significant quantities, whereas one of our reactors can cover up to a million acres of ag ground and totally replace the synthetic fertilizers there. Uh, what we want to do is feed the world nu nutritionally, nutritiously and sustainably while we're environmentally prudent. Okay, let's go back to the other slide now. We've, uh, we've been under the radar, so to speak, for, for the last four years as we've developed this, uh, this process. We own and have designed this process. Um, it is built on top of a reactor type system uh, to do hydrothermal processing. What we have done that's unusual and different is that we have shrunk that process through process intensification. A typical plant in Europe, for example, that use hydrothermal processing to make coal to burn in the utilities, so they have a carbon neutral source and can capture that $200 a ton coal, coal uh, credit or carbon credit is, uh, is a typically 14 feet in diameter and about 30 foot tall. And it cooks the, the biomass in a water solution for a period of an hour to, uh, to four and a half hours in order to, uh, to get the chemical process to change. What we've been able to do is, is totally re change that. Our reactor is 12 inches in diameter and 33 inches long. It's continuous flow. It produces more volume than what the big state-of-the-art reactors have done. And what it most in interestingly does is it penetrates the economic model. We have brought the cost of producing carbon down dramatically. So now we can be competitive in the marketplace against synthetic fertilizers and those type of products head to head. We're a bottom up approach. We don't come from the top down. We don't have one type of carbon. We have hundreds of thousands of different types of carbon in our product. And what that allows is it allows all 55,000 different classes of microbes in the soil to be able to eat the size carbon that they want to eat. What that does for us in the field, based on the data we're getting back from Roark Farms and other places, is it allows an explosion of microbe growth in the, in the microbiome and mining of most of the nutrients necessary in order to eliminate synthetic fertilizers. And that, that is our target, that's where we're headed. And uh, I am here today because my head of agronomy, uh, Chan Mazur, unfortunately is on medical leave for a while. So you, you got me unknowing exactly what we were going to talk about. But this has been absolutely fascinating. I'm really excited to uh, have been able to sit in. I have loads of things written down already. And if people are interested in Prairie Food, go to www.prairiefood.com and reach out to contact us. This is a wonderful opportunity to uh, change the world. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, we're going to turn to Lucas now. Lucas, are you ready? Yeah, can you guys hear me good? Yes, we can. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Well, as I said, my name is Lucas Fricky. I'm actually from Nebraska on Ulysses, and this is going to be a lot different than what most of you probably think, because I'm involved in livestock, um, not crop production. So a little bit of a turn of the table. Um, I come from a family farm that we raise pork. And during my time at UNL, I was involved in some quality assurance programs. And I decided that maybe um, we need to create an auditing system that's a little bit more friendly to the producer. Um, so in 2017, I started a company called Chorecheck um, and was able to bring on another business partner, Jerry Prange. Uh, you actually have seen Jerry, who works with Paige as well. And we worked together on helping capturing what's going on on the farm, um, inside of livestock barns or inside of lot, pastures, whatever have you, and we're able to help verify producer stories. So this isn't just um, a data collection situation. This is an ability for producers to capture on their own data and we verify it. 
So we originally started as an auditing software system. Um, we were digitizing records. Um, most of those were all paper-based or using an old Excel sheet. Um, and then like most things in my life, it kind of snowballed and became bigger. And then we became into uh, verifying that data. And so we were able to work with the Page Wireless Company um, in creating smart solutions to being able to verify that data from water sensors, presence sensors, uh, feed bin, uh, lagoon, you name it, we've come up with the sensors that are able to verify the processes that are going on inside of our livestock facilities. Uh, more and more consumers are super um, interested on what's going on inside of the farm. Um, actually in 2008, a Mintel data um, study came out that said 78% of consumers think that grocery stores and restaurants need to provide some type of information of how and where their food will be and specifically with the producer. So we have to have a system that's easy, um, very intuitive, but also producer centric. Um, because if we don't have good data from the producer, we're not gonna have a lot of follow through all the way to the end. Um, so we're both a system and pros team agnostic, uh, meaning that we're willing to work with anybody existing systems out there. Um, and we're also willing to work with any type of protein. I've started with pork because that's what my family works in, um, but we're having multiple different beta, beta tests um, and pilot trials um, with some people across the Midwest. Um, for a long time, the protein industry- So Jay Bond's birthday. We're going to um, collect data. And so now we actually have a means to an end. And if you guys can see my picture, here's actually just a simple way we're actually able to verify how many times people are being inside the barns, how many times they're selecting the chores that they're uh, assigned to as well. So all this is now tying into probably a long-term picture of what a lot of you have discussed and that's sustainability. Um, so more and more companies are getting vested into the suppliers of the raw products, meaning protein producers or even uh, farmers out on the field and they're wanting this data. Well. You know, if we're the ones doing the hard work and putting it into it, um, that data allows us to be able to financially incentivize us um, to do a better job and to help tell that story. Uh, people are willing to pay for it. Um, there's actually a 2004 study done in Utah um, that showed people were willing to pay upwards of a dollar more per pound of pork, um, $2 more for beef, and 75 cents more for chicken because they knew the traceability and transparency of the product. Um, but coming with those needs for information um, and those wanting of the understanding of the sustainability of the farmer also opens us up to situations that um, can incur people coming onto our farms that don't need to be there. So Chorchuk acts as the intermediary distributing that data um, through a blockchain format. So again, being system and protein agnostic, no matter what we're collecting, we're not, we're not selling the data without the producer's knowledge, um, but also protecting the producer's identity um, throughout the process, as well as their ability to maybe be a little bit better than the other producer down the road. But at the same time, uh, raising the tide and lifting all boats that people can trust the product um, that they are working in. So we're, the future of our company is going is, you know, we're Laura based right now. Um, we have quite a few innovations, but our pipeline of innovation is kind of being hampered off for the simple reason we don't have the bandwidth and connectivity to be able to get there. So especially with what Page Wireless is doing um, to help open up that, uh, that pipeline and be able to get a sustainable internet into these areas, that's where we're gonna be able to thrive. Um, and I really go to Rorick's comments at the beginning saying his son, I need to be connected. Well, I need the same thing. Uh, being a row crop farmer, I feel his struggles trying to work with um, uh, supporting industries, but especially when it comes to livestock industries, we are definitely behind the curve uh, when it comes to the ability to use precision agricultural tools. Um, but with the ability of that pipeline opening up, we're actually able to create more solutions um, and better connect with consumers, have healthier animal, animals, um, and be even more sustain sustainable than where we're at. Um, all at the same time, creating a financial incentive for producers um, and getting the money back to them where they need it. So I appreciate the time today to talk to you guys. 
Um, if you have any questions, hit me up in the chat. Um, I'll also put my contact information and Jerry's contact information there as well. Wonderful, Lucas. And we've got our anchor speaker. Chris, are you ready to go? I'm ready. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Do you want me to share my screen? Oh, there you go. Great. Awesome. Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, really humbled, thrilled to be here. Um, I've got uh, half a dozen slides. I'm going to go through them very quickly. Uh, I'm going to tell a story about data. And um, it is just amazing to hear all these stories about the subject matter experts and, and those who have operating experience in the field talk about um, the synthesis, if you will, of uh, the expert humans uh, with the possibility of data and digital subsystems uh, creating a new generation of expert systems, um, sort of like a cyber physical system where there's the people uh, that are the subject matter experts not being displaced by, but being augmented by uh, sensing and instrumentation in the field. Um, I personally believe that one of the greatest frontiers in economic, social, and um, global development or redevelopment is in fact the instrumentation of the physical world, knowing uh, what is happening uh, in our ambient environments, in our local and regional environments, and then building, if you will, bottom up, a complementary picture of ground truth about what's happening in the world that can complement some of the true value in satellite and counter some of the hype in satellite. And so I'm gonna tell a story about data uh, in your world. And, and it goes like this, commodity markets, which drive the vast majority of our revenue uh, in agriculture products were structured over a century ago when we thought resources were infinite and we didn't have any digital information at all. And so that is the world that we're still living in as buyers and sellers in these markets. But today the conditions are inverted where our physical resources are under enormous pressure. We're nowhere near abundance as some folks would say we're on the cusp of, but rather we've got some serious climate challenges that show up in physical risk and transition risk. And right now data is just about everywhere, except in most cases in the possession of securely the growers. So here's my value proposition to you folks. Your data is as important as your crop. Next, please. And uh, I think we went two ahead. And so what am I trying to say? Historically, commodities were priced based on meeting a standard specification physically and availability in time, scheduling. Today, we're seeing increasingly, buyers are looking for what we're calling climate differentiated products, low carbon footprint, no, low methane footprint, low water footprint, things of that nature. It's not just about the traditional definitions of the commodity, but now there are these new climate resilient attributes that are doing two things essentially, defending market positions and opening new market positions for those premium priced and premium differentiated products. I want to be clear, it's not just about getting more money per pound or per unit, but in some cases it's about defending contracts where these new climate attributes are required. What does this mean? It means that buyers of your products are going to be placing more emphasis on these climate attributes and they're going to be placing more orders for products that can be proven to have those climate attributes, low carbon, low water, et cetera. And finally, those operators that can prove that their operations are being managed low carbon, low water, low toxin, to produce the products that can be certified low carbon, low water, low toxin, they're finding that they've got an increased access to capital and a lower cost of capital. At the end of the day, it's about access to markets for revenue and access to markets for capital. But it's about what you can prove. Next, please. And this isn't some future world. This is, in fact, happening right now in a broad swath of commodity products metals, mining, oil and gas. We're seeing in the top 10 or 12 building materials, including cement, for example. We're seeing this almost everywhere. The idea that climate change is real, it's driving physical risk and transition risk. Those are the two key terms we all need to understand. Investors, risk managers, buyers are obsessed with physical risk and transition risk. As it's driven by climate, we've got to respond. So what does that do or where does that take us? It means this quite simply, your buyers, your lenders, your investors, your sources of revenue and your sources of capital, your sources of risk coverage, they are all increasing their emphasis on something called climate resilience or your physical risk or your transition risk management. They're focusing on carbon, they're focusing on water, they're focusing on other dimensions of climate resilience and they're using your ability to prove your operations resilience as a way to determine risk. 
and they're using your ability to prove or attach your carbon or water or other climate attribute to your product as a way to figure out if you're going to be part of the order or not. And they're doing it with data. Next, please. And a key source of the data, I want to be very, very clear about this. Last slide. Bear with me on this. Number one, to the left, on the bottom, the key source of data for any of this is ground truth instrumentation from sensing and instrumentation networks that are on your properties. That is the holy grail of being able to prove what you're doing operationally and how your products do or don't meet these new and emerging specifications. This data needs to be protected, needs to be secured in box number two it, with rules and tools that the finance markets have used for a while, national security markets have used for a while, you don't have to use. Here's my sales pitch, my business does that. You secure the data as if it's an asset, as if it is the treasure that your families have considered it for decades. Part three, because others are gonna to wanna to get access to it to run their risk pricing and business and investment models. And ultimately, part four, trades are happening today on new exchanges where these climate attributes are the differentiating feature. It's not just the CME and it's not just the LSE. It is the exchanges we know, but new exchanges are coming. My final pitch to you folks is this. As you go about doing all this wonderful work that we heard over the past couple of hours, please, I beg you, treat your data as if it is its own class of asset. Protect it, secure it, make it stable, make it immutable, and make sure that you are prepared to prove not just what your operations do, but what your products do. You're going to hear lots of terms on that last slide. I'm happy to go through them later, but pedigree, where it comes from, provenance, where it's been, veracity, how it's been stable. These buyers, these investors are going to do more business with you, and you're going to do better business if you're treating the data in the same way that you treat the crop. I'm sorry I went over. I really appreciate the time. Um, and I wanted to just thank Billy and Rourke and everyone else for giving us the opportunity to share a little bit. Thank you. Rourke, I'm turning it over to you quickly. Go ahead. Can you hear us okay? Perfect. Uh, I'd, I'd like to welcome uh, Senator Wishart. Uh, Anna and I have known each other for some time and have been involved in a lot of these conversations of, of just exactly what Chris laid out just perfectly for us is, is, is what is climate change? What is soil health? And, and what, what do we need to do at the state leadership in the legislature? And uh, I'd like to welcome Anna and, and uh, uh, take it away, Senator Wishart. Well, hi everybody. Um, really exciting uh, information. I just got to listen to the last two presentations and um, it got re me really excited. First of all, I want to thank Rourke and I also want to thank Julie um, for, for connecting me to this group as well. Um, you know, for me as a senator, one of the reasons I ran for office is to be involved in innovation and finding creative ways to solve some of the pressing issues that we face and climate change is one of them. And, um, you know, I'm at the point in terms of the research I've done um, where there is no denying in my mind that, that we are facing um, changes to our climate that will threaten a lot of our livelihoods uh, if we don't start to act and, and lead on, on finding innovative solutions to this. Um, so it's really exciting to hear what you're doing. A lot of times in the legislature, we spend a lot of our time debating sort of past issues uh, over and over again and putting out sort of current um, challenges, but we don't spend a lot of time talking about the future and innovations that we can be investing in, supporting, that will have sort of future benefits. And so it's exciting to be with this group and, and hear really a, a lot of the work that's being done now. Um, you know, for me, I'm an urban senator in terms of the representation, but did get an opportunity to meet with Rourke uh, on his farm and, and tour several years ago some of the incredible innovations that are going on in the private sector and also through our university. And so if there's anything I can do on, on the policy side, you know, a lot of times as a state, we focus on supporting um, business sort of innovations, finding creative ways to, to fund some innovations that not only help our private sector industry, like the egg world, just be able to reduce their overall costs, but also have a public benefit associated with it as well. And so I'd be really interested in looking at how we as a state can become a leader 
uh, in sort of ag technology, um, recognizing our responsibility as a state in helping to feed the world, and also our responsibility then as being a leader and making sure our efforts to do that are sustainable. So excited to keep working with you. Um, and if there's any kind of really creative, like innovative sort of policy work that, that you want to work with me on, I am all game for that. Um, several years ago, I worked with uh, former Senator Tyson Larson, um, who represented a district in the O'Neill area. And together, we were able to get a bipartisan initiative through the legislature, overcoming a filibuster um, to make Nebraska the most contemporary state for autonomous vehicles, recognizing the importance in the ag sector world, but also just transforming our transportation sector as well. And so I'm always looking for those kind of cutting edge policies where we as a state can start to lead on some innovations um, and have the rest of the country follow our lead. Senator, as always, thank you, but hang on one second here. I'm going to give you a little virtual tour that as a result of rural connectivity. So we are actually about a mile away from the farm, but we are in real time making this transmission of what you just alluded to is how do we connect rural broadband and make those make those connections and make those opportunities. So here we are. We're right down where it all happens. This is exactly where it is. And, and again, thank you for taking the time today. And, uh, and thank you for investing in Nebraska. Appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. And um, if any of you want to connect with me, um, you can get my information from Rourke or from Julie. And again, would love to, um, you know, maybe after November, if, if I, I'm up for re-election. So if I am honored to get to serve another four years, would love to sit down and see if there are some policy um, uh, initiatives that that we can work on again um, to make Nebraska a leader in this ag tech space. Thanks again, Senator. Appreciate it a lot. I'm going to hand this over to Eric Range for just a brief summary of what the system is that we're actually connecting to today for Wi-Fi right here on the farm. Thanks, Roy. Um, real briefly, what we've set up is um, about a 30 by 30 meg symmetrical network covering about 500 acres out here at Roy. So um, we've been riding around in uh, uh, his Kubota at the moment, uh, but uh, we've also got a combine set up, as you know, earlier and a, and a tractor. So um, when we're not watching uh, Netflix, um, we're, we're out here actually uh, trying to get some things done. Thank you. So here's what we're all after is this guy right here. <laughs> Thank you all. Back Thanks to you. To Okay, so leaving Rourke and Jerry live at the field, we're uh, running a bit behind schedule, but we'll be, um, we've just set an extra challenge for our esteemed panel, which is just fantastic. We're going to turn to them next for some reflections on tying all these things together and where this network comes together. So Susie, can you throw up the, um, the screen share again um, as the prompts? And so our first up, we've got, um, we've got Bruce. Bruce, are you ready to go? I am. All right, terrific. Take it away. Okay, I'll, I'll accept your challenge and try to go as fast as I can. Um, I'm Bruce Reeker, Vice President of Government Relations, and uh, my assignment uh, at, at Farm Bureau, but my assignment is to tie, try and tie some of the opportunities, expectations together. I'll tell you my perspective, where we're coming from. The thing that keeps us up at night, especially me, is what does the farmer of the future look like and will we be relevant to them and what are we doing uh, to be relevant? What I'm gonna try and do real quick in tying some things together is probably start with the micro, go to a little bit of the macro and back again. Uh, some numbers about Nebraska. Uh, it's a diverse agricultural state. We have about 45,000 uh, producers, about 15,000 of them are members of Farm Bureau. Uh, the diversity includes corn, soybeans, pork, sunflower, millet, uh, beef production. Lucas talked about the, the hog production. We have 19 million acres of crops. And Rorick talked a little bit about uh, those bags of seed up front. Uh, but when you think about the plants on each one of those acres, we have about 30 to 35,000 plants, all capable of collecting data from those. We're in the top three in corn production. Uh, we have 6.8 million head of cattle uh, in Nebraska. We also have pork and, 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 and poultry, as I mentioned. 
where does this go? And I'm going to take a little bit of a different perspective. Uh, we've talked a lot about production, and I think that I, I have learned so much uh, listening to all this. But I'm going to talk about the, the critical infrastructure that needs to be in place with the emphasis on the network, like Page Wireless is putting together, uh, making sure that our producers are connected. Historically, we've thought about the critical infrastructure being highways, water canals, railroads, things like that. Those are all very important and absolutely necessary for, for ag production. But we also have uh, a critical infrastructure need and that is e-connectivity. Uh, coronavirus has actually highlighted some of the importance of this with the disruption of the food chain. I think it actually, uh, even though it was hard uh, or is hard, it has helped us demonstrate to the, to the nation, to the state and the, and the world about the importance of the food supply chain as we, as we look at transportation, distribution, warehousing and logistics. It's about storage, it's about input suppliers, it's about connectivity between uh, those uh, particular vendors as well as animal processing. Uh, animal processing is huge in this state. When you think about the fact that an animal can be slaughtered and uh, the meat from that, uh, that animal can be in one of 20 states within 24 hours. It is a very interconnected uh, system. However, we need to have a lot more uh, transparency, traceability, as Lucas talked about, uh, grain processing the same way. Uh, so there are, there are several opportunities. Um, Excel efficiency, what I've been hearing, expansion, reducing uh, the resources it takes to produce, cleaner processes, uh, improved quality. And uh, then um, I've, I've talked about this a little bit. I'll just share just a little bit of experience. Uh, I used to work on Capitol Hill time and time again. I heard people in DC talk about how Nebraska is in the middle of the flyover zone. And I, com I see it completely the opposite. Nebraska is in the middle of everywhere. Uh, we're important to practically everyone. And uh, the expectations that uh, everyone in, in this state, this country and around the world have for transparency, traceability, food security is growing every day. But uh, you know, we're important to everyone because we feed them. And uh, the internet of things, especially ag, um, is not only an expectation, but pretty soon it's gonna be mandated by so many of the partners that we have in the food supply chain. And we have to have not only the inter interconnectivity of farms like Rorick is doing there, but also the interconnectivity with all of his suppliers and with all of his consumers, whether it's the co-ops, whether it's the ethanol plants, uh, whether it goes into human food consumption, uh, all of those things, uh, and I'll let uh, the uh, other speakers talk about technologies that may help with that, such as blockchain, blockchain technology, but uh, I tried to do that as fast as I could. I'll wrap it up now. Thanks, Bruce. Dwayne, right. are you ready to give your remarks? Yep, I'm ready. I'm Dwayne Roth. I'm with Syngenta. I'm an Indigent Sustainable Lead, and I help connect growers to uh, basically the end user and uh, right in front of us here we're talking about commerce traceability and blockchain that's exactly like we've all agreed today um, when somebody barcodes something at your local grocery store they want that digital data maybe not to read it there but to have the opportunity if they if, if they could have it there um, we're doing this through continuous improvement i like to use that word we use the word sustainability but um, a lot of the conferences i've been going to that is just a highly debatable word. And I think um, it's, it needs to be said, but we're continuously improving all of our farming practices. I mean, if we, we, we spoke yesterday about how do we get the percentage from 5% up to 85%. Um, before my role with Syngenta, I was an ag producer for 30 years. I had a succession plan with my nephews. They have basically taken over the farm. Uh, but how do, we, how do we bridge that gap? Uh, how do we how do we how do we uh, get to the 85 percent and it will be through digital data um the consumer will i would maybe they will require of it some consumers are already making that requirement of us uh, and so how do we use our our, our least amount of resources to produce the, the most amount of protein we can deliver to them so um i appreciate uh, i appreciate the opportunity to talk to everybody um and uh the next couple of years, we're going to try to 
engage more people, more folks to be more sustainable, continuous improvement in agriculture to feed the world. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, Dwayne. Like Rorick, Dwayne's one of those people who puts people together. He's a really good one to know if you want to find more people doing like-minded like things. Uh, we'll turn to you next, Boone. Great. Yeah, good morning. Um, I'm Boone McAfee. I serve as the Director of Research and Stewardship for the Nebraska Corn Board. Um, so as a checkoff organization, you know, it's really our mission to deliver return on investment for our checkoff investors or Nebraska's corn farmers. And we do that by creating opportunities that enhance demand, add value, and ensure sustainability of both corn and the industry. And, you know, so from our perspective, you know, as I think about innovation and the direction it's headed, I think what I'm most excited about or what I'm most encouraged to see, and I think what the lightning round really demonstrated this morning really well is how innovation and sustainability in agriculture are really um, intertwined. And I, I think in my opinion, almost becoming synonymous with one another. You know, thinking about kind of those three pillars of sustainability, the economic, the environmental, the social, um, innovations kind of like what we've seen this morning are really addressing at least one of those pillars, if not multiple pillars simultaneously, and really are kind of, you know, blurring the lines between them. And I think that's where opportunities um, like, like Bruce and Dwayne mentioned are kind of being found. Um, but when it comes down to it, you know, I think those opportunities, innovations, they only are possible because of one critical component, and that's, and that's the data. You know, take, for example, um, we heard from the TAPS program this morning and Project Sense, both projects with the university that the Corn Board has been involved with. And, and data is what really allows us to show, um, you know, that resource use efficiency and, and profit aren't mutually exclusive goals for producers. Um, you know, data is what creates value in the supply chain by demonstrating, um, you know, our reduced environmental footprint um, of ag producers or helping validate agricultural practices um, that may provide these ecosystem service opportunities like carbon insetting or climate mitigation. And, and data in general is what allows agriculture to show continuous improvement, like Duane kind of mentioned, um, which ultimately builds uh, social capital, you know, positively influences public opinion, and then finally protects producers' uh, freedom to operate using the tools and innovations that they choose and that work best um, for their farm and operation. Uh, you know, that being said, right now, I think most producers are, are facing low prices and as profit margins get smaller, so does that allowable margin of error or the risk that producers want to take on. And so on one hand, you know, we have producers um, who, who have been able to see how leveraging their data alone or aggregated with their peers um, has actually helped them, you know, reduce the risk associated with innovation or adopting practices um, and finding kind of those value opportunities. Um, but on the other hand, you know, there's producers who also see both real and perceived risk from how their data could be used against them um, or to provide somebody else with, with a greater benefit. So no matter what end of that spectrum you kind of look at, I think it's clear that, that there is value to this data and we need to protect that. And so, you know, we strongly believe in, in farmers retaining ownership and, and uh, control of how that data is used, but understand that we need to find ways to reconcile kind of producer ownership and control of data um, with the data needs of innovators really in order to drive and return that value to ag producers um, and do that in a way that's that's simple, uh, transparent, and then ultimately trusted. And so I think opportunities like what we're doing today um, will hopefully help achieve that and find those solutions and kind of look forward to hearing thoughts from, from the rest of the panelists and, and anybody participating today. Thank you. Thanks, Boone. What an awesome tee up for our next speaker. Billy Tiller, you're next. Can you hear me, Amy? Yes, sir. All right. Well, I'm going to explain what a Texan is doing on the phone with a huge group from Nebraska, but I'm the CEO of a group called Grower Information Services Cooperative. It's the Ag Data Cooperative in Ag. And I also am a farmer in Texas, so I farm in the Panhandle of Texas. Uh, I was honored to actually have a good friend in Nebraska, Rourke, that uh, put me in touch with Twin Plant Natural Resource District. GISC has built along with the collaborative effort uh, with Twin Plant, what I would really call a project of Internet of Things at scale. And what makes that project so creative is not really GIC, it's a collaborative effort of the effort of the employees, and the management of Twin Plant NRD, along with uh, electric companies that were involved like Dawson Public Power and, and Midwest uh, Electric Cooperative. Uh, Page Wireless was involved when we had non-electric wells because we were actually using IoT devices that we didn't own, meeting the electric smart meters. And we've been able to convert that data into water data by using uh, ultrasonic flow meter 
uh, readings from every well. There's about 320,000 acres, over 3,000 wells. The exciting part of the work is the adoption. The adoption's coming in first year at a little over 50%. So that's exciting. I think if we hadn't had COVID, I think we'd have hit even a higher mark. That's really a compliment to all the collaborative parties involved. So I'm gonna move on and really talk about, uh, I've been teed up to talk about really what's going on in ag and the ag tech world. And I just wanna say that, you know, uh, one of the things that's going on, in, and, and I believe Bruce said it yesterday on kind of a get ready call, he said, progress moves only at the speed of trust. And I'm going to tell you, as a farmer, as a CEO of GSC, we've got to have more trust in ag. We've got to get where there's simplicity and agreements. We have to be able to look at a one page or know, hey, am I okay sharing my data here? There's a group in ag called the Ag Data Transparency Evaluator. I tell you to have a look at it. You can Google that. The next thing I want to say, we've got to, we've got to autonomize. I like what uh, Paul Welbeck, a good friend of mine, was talking about earlier, the autonomous vehicles. But we really got to get where we can autonomize uh, data collection. I mean, farmers, when they get a smartphone, they know they can get the weather with the click of a button. We have to do the same thing with ag data. We got to automate how it's collected. I mean, why do you think that every uh, event in an ag life that involves word auto works, auto steer, auto swap, you name it, it works. So the next thing I want to say is we got to get rid of siloed data. I mean, the industry, if you're a party in the industry and you still have a moat around your data, especially not allowing farmers to share that with trusted parties, that's a mistake. That's slowing down the industry. We need to keep that moving. The only way to help it move quicker, we get trust, but we got to allow that farmer to be in charge of permissions to share his data. And I think, too, we got to forget, we've got this big thing going on in ag tech, rag tech. Uh, leaders are saying, hey, we're about to have this huge transformational change where grandpa has now got, uh, grandson's got the farm, they're all going to adopt technology. I got news for you, grandpa's in good shape, he's thinking well, uh, he will adopt technology if you'll build for him, we've proved it in twin plant. Uh, you don't have to be able to build it simple, but you got to make it easy to use and you got to show him there's value in it. So what I want to wrap up quickly is say, when you build value into a product, you show a farmer an ROI, he will adopt. I'm going to stop there, Amy, and uh, let the rest of the panel talk. Thank you so much, Billy. Tyler, you're next. Okay, thank you, Amy. Yeah, so I'm Tyler Harris. I'm editor of Nebraska Farmer. Uh, we're an agriculture-focused publication based in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, what, what we do is we cover the gamut of agriculture, but we try to focus on uh, identifying strategies um, and, and different steps that producers in particular can take to kind of optimize their ROI uh, overall. And, and so I guess that kind of gets me to the first point because when we're talking about overall some of the hurdles to adoption, um, I, I think uncertainty is probably a big one of those. And, and um, that gets back to connectivity. And we know, and I'm glad that Billy pointed it out that you know, the issue of the at large amount of asset transfer that's supposed to happen over the next 20 years between the generations. But we're, we're also looking at a situation where there is a huge value at stake when we're talking about the value of precision ag and the amount of input use efficiency that can come from that using that in the proper way. Uh, but one of the hurdles is the lack of connectivity. And I think we've seen that obviously throughout Western Nebraska. And, and we've seen that in certain issues come up and, you know, in, in my conversations with Bruce, for example, um, that, you know, in just, you know, in the need to change the way that the FCC highlights certain areas that have broadband shortages. Um, and, and, and from the overall issue of, um, adoption and and I can't remember who it was earlier that kind of highlighted that 85 percent but I hear that number thrown out quite a bit when we're talking about especially in regards to irrigation and using remote sensing to make irrigation scheduling the number I hear often is that 15 percent of growers only 15 percent use at least use uh, remote sensing to make those irrigation decisions so how do you bridge that gap and kind of address that and close that um, and as Billy pointed out, value, the value proposition is the big way to address that. And so I, I, I think one of the ways that 
that can be addressed in and of itself is through certain things like data collection. And that's why things like the on-farm research network are so valuable, right? Um, because they've done this, you know, certain studies for multiple years. I know they've done soybean population studies. Now they've done Project Sense for uh, several years now, kind of identifying those areas that are optimized, uh, you know, th those certain rates or, you know, uh, practices that are optimized for profitability across a broad spectrum of uh, production environments in Nebraska. And I think that's the kind of the big challenge ahead, looking at adoption is being able to verify um, and being able to throw out a quantifiable value for producers to be able to say, this is something I feel confident doing. Here's how we close that gap and, and bring that to the other 85%. And the other thing is just seeing guys like Rorick out there who are already on the bleeding cutting edge of adoption um, and, and they're seeing it work on these farms and it's something that they see their neighbor doing it. It's something they feel a little bit more com confident adopting on their own farm. So I think that's a big part of the value proposition. The other thing I would just uh, really um, praise is UNL's TAPS uh, program. And, and as somebody who has competed in that for several years, never, never very successfully, but um, it, it's always interesting to see the broad range of participants and how far that program is spread because it's not just growers that are participating, it's, it's journalists like myself, uh, it's people who are you know, involved in governmental agencies that are involved, people, um, people who otherwise would not be put directly in the farmer's shoes have an opportunity to do that. So I think that's just incredibly powerful in, in addition to the data that it creates by putting everybody in a situation where they're encouraged to make some decisions that they might not otherwise. So. Um, overall, I would say that there are a number of tools that we have to kind of close that gap. Um, we know what the challenges are, I think, and that's what's so great about this group is that we have a lot of people who are very aware of what needs to be done. We've identified it. Um, the, the next step is, is I, I think, is just identifying the certain steps that we need to take to kind of close that gap and bring those 85% a little closer to the, to the 15%. Thank you so much, Tyler. Wow, that's a great segue. Julie, you're up. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Julie Bichelle, the president of Page Wireless. We're deploying a statewide LoRaWAN network across Nebraska and also, as you see today, designing networks that are specific for agricultural use and deliver the connectivity that's needed. Um, we believe that open standards compliant, reliable networks designed for agriculture specifically would improve uh, producer engagement and accelerate adoption. Uh, it's time that we break down the silos and the proprietary networks in uh, agriculture, which are inhibiting adoption uh, due to uh, high cost and now an array of disparate networks. Um, if we work in a more collaborative fashion through open source APIs and put the power back in the hands of the producer so that they can choose the solution that works best for them, choose where their data flows and how they want to use it, uh, we'll see an increased adoption. And I, I think really um, a more cost competitive nature um, across the ag tech sector. If we're all focusing on our strengths and everyone in this meeting today focus on our strengths, um, we'll deliver solutions that are producer focused. Uh, and I think, uh, as Billy mentioned, the Twin Plat NRD project is true proof of that. Um, collaborative partners from all sectors came together and we're all working together through open source APIs to deliver easy, uh, simple solutions for adoption. Thank you so much to um, all of our panel speakers. We're gonna actually, I think, get back on time in a, in a way that I'm gonna put one more challenge to this panel really quick, because one of the things we'd like to do with everybody, all participants on this call, when we send a short survey for, you know, providing a little, getting, collecting a little more information to help uh, foster the, the development of our network and connectivity amongst us. A challenge I'm gonna put to the panelists, you guys can be great role models here, in the order that you spoke already, could you do us a favor and tell us one step or one action that you could see yourself taking or those that you work with taking um, following this call based on what you've heard today? Well, I guess that, yeah, yeah. that 
Yep. And I will say that showcasing everything that uh, all of these experts uh, shared and what I've learned, uh, getting that within our, our shared with our network of 15,000 producers across the state, helping them to start understand uh, some of the possibilities and the importance of this. Fantastic. How about you, Dwayne? What action will you take? Collectively collab collaborating, Amy. I just think, you know, we're going to have to, even if it's our competition, we're going to have to somewhat collaborate uh, to make to make this work for the ag producer. So we're going to have to reach across the lines, however you want to call it, but we're going to have to collaborate with everyone in the ag space for the ag producer. Thanks. Turning to you, Boone. I'd say probably similar to Bruce, um, you know, the corn board we represent, you know, 21,000 checkoff paying corn producers across Nebraska. So, you know, using our, our, you know, outreach and education to help get this to producers, but also then tell the story of producers to those, um, whether it's the public, whether it's, it's, it's policy, whether it's the supply chain, um, helping showcase that to, to those different routes as well. Um, um, and I think yeah, just kind of playing, hopefully the connector a little bit and bringing some of those groups together to continue these discussions. Thank you so much, um, Billy. You know, as I, I listened today and I heard about products, I heard about processes, I heard from companies, a lot of fantastic stuff. I, I do think we're living in a world in the ag tech world, especially when we have companies that start up and they, they raise capital and then they quickly bring a product to market. Uh, some of those lack validation. And I was thinking today, about some of the companies that really seem like they had some validation. When you have the university involved, the UNL there, I think that brings validation. I think when you have independent resources, that brings validation. I think that's something that's needed if we're gonna create adoption in the market, because not only do we need, need validation, I was thinking about uh, the term customer discovery. And, and really, we need more farmers involved so that products get built in a way that they're usable to farmers and they bring and they help with either cost reduction or increased profitability through increased revenue. So I'll stop there, but I wish we'd do more customer discovery with farmers. I wish we'd get out of the Silicon Valley and out of the offices, talk to more growers. I think we'd be better off and I'd like to see that happen. Fantastic. Tyler, over to you. What will you do after this call? So uh, as, a, as a journalist, our circulation is probably, you know, just a little under 30,000. That's just including Nebraska. Some of our sister publications have more or less. Um, one of the things that, uh, as I mentioned, I, I like to do is highlight strategy, but it's also about numbers. And I, and I think one of the things that Lucas Fricke threw out, and he gave some very good clear cut numbers on the profit potential of, of certain things like traceability and being able to verify what you're doing. Um, and, and I think the how and the why and the what, while not all of that, that might not cover the whole story of what we try to do with each individual, you know, with all the content that we put out there. I think that's a huge piece here in, in kind of highlighting some of those strategies that producers can adopt and the value that could, that the value potential that's there should they, you know, if they make these decisions and adopt certain technologies and practices. I think that's incredibly powerful. So for me, just being able to connect with the people that have, you know, that, that have verifiable, trustworthy numbers like Lucas uh, presented there from a 2004 study, um, that's incredibly powerful. Fantastic. And Julie, you can wrap up for us. Sure. Um, I would like to invite everyone within this ecosystem that we see on the screen now and on the call today to leverage the network that we built at Rorix um, for free. I think that e-connectivity is the foundation uh, to get where we all talked about where we need to go. And I hope that lowers all of our solutions R&D um, by actually having the connectivity that you've always wished you had to get your product to market. Really terrific. Thanks, Julie, and thanks to all of our panelists. This is such an exciting time where the ability to actually bring a lot of these things that have been in development together through personal networks um, that trust one another is really exciting. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Crystal. This is the with, to talk about this diagram that she threw up earlier. Crystal, can you take it away? Sure. And Susan, is there the picture of kind of the, the next, the emerging one that up next? Or do I need... Okay. Click ahead to that one. So that the other one, so this has kind of the same uh, set of, 
of pieces to it, but it's just talking about, well, what is this emerging network? How does it look? And where do each of us connect? And so um, mostly putting this up as, as food for thought to think about um, where do you fit in this network and how can you um, make this transition happen more easily? Um, you know, just to reiterate things that people have already said a few times is how do we make sure that we're ensuring privacy while we're thinking about automating that processing piece, um, sending out data to others who might want to use it, um, and making sure that this feeds back to the farmer so that it ultimately results in improved decision making for the actual acre. So I'll stop there. So we've got plenty of time to discuss um, and ask questions. Fantastic, Crystal. Okay, yeah, and just so you know that, that, uh, that diagram that she's shown actually has a bunch of data layers underneath it and she's updating it with all the people that are joining us today and the information you provided when you registered. And so ideally what we're gonna do after this call is work further on this, we're calling it the spider web, <laughs> to provide this visual representation of all of the cross connectivity in this expanding network. Uh, Rorick, can we turn it over to you for a moment before we, as we start, we're now kind of talking about, well, what do we do with this network and the next steps? I've got a bunch of notes, but I think if you're ready, I can toss it over to you for a moment to provide some reflections as well. Okay, I'm, can you hear me okay? Yep, can hear you great. All right, what are you seeing on the screen? I'm not certain which way I've got it flipped. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, just hold on a sec now, let's see. So, Susie will. I'm seeing your gorgeous face and uh, a smile. Oh, thanks, Billy. Thank Did you, you all. Your... There you go. So right, I, want to, I want to extend the same invitation uh, that Julie so graciously led into you and, and their participation. But more importantly is you can look at what it takes to connect the combine. You can take a look at what it takes to connect the gator. And, and I'm sitting in my tractor today, which will be part of that grain cart opportunity that supports all of that. But this couldn't be possible without connectivity. It couldn't be possible without real broadband. And, and I work tirelessly in that realm as well too, is all of us, we, we wanna be able to connect better. There's, there's a, a primary piece, a primary uh, pump that's got to be pushed. It's got to be uh, elevated uh, over and over again. And whatever we can do collectively and individually, uh, I'm in. I am game. And, and our farm is your, you can call it a playground, you can call it a, a lab, you can call it a, an opportunity, whatever you want to call it. Uh, Zach and I are, are in in terms of, of uh, to our best of our ability, we'll try to beat, meet and, and beat your expectations. So uh, thank you to all of you. A tremendous, tremendous day. Thank you to, to Amy Kremen and to uh, Susan Hutton and also to Crystal Powers. But all of you for taking your time. And I look forward to conversation about next steps. And it, I'm really easy to get hold of because uh, palmanfarms.com, uh, but also obviously through this connection. So thank you again. Thank you, Rourke. So I've got a quick jotted list here that I've been keeping as I've been listening to you all speak. And so you mentioned earlier the recording will be shared. We'll actually do this. We'll make sure we've got everybody's contact info to build into that Google Doc. So everybody's got that kind of information. Additional links um, that we can collect that you will be invited to share. Please go ahead. Do not be shy. Um, with providing, you know, more background on what you're doing. The job listings that Laura shared, I think there's more out there from from all the different groups represented and it would be a fantastic way for us to get good people working for other good people. Um, you know, I think that there's going to be other opportunities to engage. We're planning to do another event like this during harvest from Rourke's Combine. And so stay tuned for that. We'll try to give a little more advanced notice, I guess, with the advertising and uh, to, to invite people in your network to join and to continue this conversation. Um, and uh, and let's see, I think, you know, there's, and then that, that network, the conceptual network that, that Crystal's building that actually has a lot of intelligence built into to who's doing what and where. What we'd really like to do is follow up with you all and find out how you'd like to connect um, with one another and help, help support and foster those connections and help deepen them. And so um, with that, Rourke, I will turn it over to you for one last word. I wanna thank all the um, speakers 
the panelists, everybody who participated and, and hung in here for this wonderful um, roller coaster ride. But if you know Rourke, um, this, was, this was right on, right on uh, it, was, it was the way things go. So thanks Rourke, thank you for hosting this and for pulling us all together. We certainly uh, appreciate it and benefit from it every day. So if you've got ideas, obviously share them. Uh, this conversation between UNL and us on this smart farm, smart lab, uh, if you've got, uh, I think a great, um, a great relationship would be through FFA or, or a teaching environment. If you've got a ag teacher or if you've got a science teacher, if you've got a, an institution that, that would, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's a remote classroom in this, in this crazy world we're living in right now. Those opportunities exist here. They're, it, it, you know, the sky's the limit. You know, let's not let's not think let's not think the here and now. Let's think about what this thing could look like, should look like, and more importantly, will look like. Again, thanks to all of you. Uh, let's do this again. All right. Take care, everybody. Thanks for your time. Have a great day. Thank you.